Welcome to Spiral Dynamics Stage Red. This is a continuation of my multi-part series on the psychological developmental model known as Spiral Dynamics. I'm not going to introduce that whole model here. We're just going to jump right into Stage Red. I've already covered stages blue, orange, green, yellow, and even turquoise. And so uh, we're sort of moving backwards here down the spiral and we have a lot of material to cover, so let's get started. Uh, I want to make sure I give credit here to some important people who developed Spiral Dynamics, this model. It's an amazing model, and they did some amazing work here. They really dev devoted their lives to, to fleshing out this model and making it popular. So credits go to Claire Graves, who was the original developer of the, the value system underneath the model, and then Don Beck and Christopher Cohen, or popularizing it and fleshing it out and giving it the label Spiral Dynamics. I also want to give credit to a website called SpiralDynamicsIntegral.nl from which I pulled some information here that I'll be quoting directly. And I also pulled a lot of material from the Spiral Dynamics book written by Don Beck and by Christopher Cohen. Sometimes I just rip out entire phrases or words or sentences from that book and I'll be uh, quoting a lot of that stuff here. So by no means did I make all of this up myself. So the way that Spiral Dynamics works, just to refresh your memory a little bit, uh, and I'm going to show you here uh, a chart of, of the Spiral Dynamic base, uh, model. Basically what it is, is it's a series of stages that humans evolve through both individually and collectively. As society, our culture evolves through these stages. It goes from beige to purple to red, which we'll be talking about now, then to um, blue, orange, green, yellow, and turquoise. So now we're starting to talk about the, the lower stages. This episode is going to be on red. I'm going to have a follow-up episode soon on purple. Uh, I'm not going to talk about beige. Uh, but red is an, interesting, it's an interesting stage because it's one of those stages which is active in many parts of the world in third world countries, in developing countries, that uh, most of us in advanced Western democracies and in the first world aren't too familiar with, so we can easily get tricked by stage red because we don't see a lot of it in our everyday lives, even though there's still plenty of it present in America, in Europe, and in other advanced developed countries, so we have to be careful because we can get tricked by red. And, and red can be a, a very, very dangerous and problematic stage as you'll start to see here. So, again, just to give you the big picture of what is Spiral Dynamics really modeling or explaining, it's explaining the evolution of the human psyche. It's explaining human value systems as they relate to the environment, the social environment that we find ourselves in, having to survive in as humans. So what's unique about humans is that Unlike other animals, which just live in some static environment, like you know, a monkey is living in a rainforest somewhere, or a zebra is living on the savanna, or a bear is living in the woods, uh, their environment has stayed the same for hundreds of thousands and maybe millions of years, and those animals haven't changed. Like crocodiles, for example, have existed for, for tens of millions of years and even longer, basically since the age of the dinosaurs, and they haven't changed very much because their environments are basically the same. And so it works for them. But for humans, what's unique about us as a, as a social species is that we have a symbolic system which we can use, you know, writing, talking, ideas, philosophy, culture, uh, education, books, entertainment, media, art, all of this, all of these cultural artifacts that we have. So we are literally transforming our own environment because we're constructing cities and societies, we're not only engineering the physical environment by building roads and bridges and you know, clearing forests and things like this, 
But more importantly, we're building a sort of a culture, a sort of a software environment. Not just the hardware of the environment, but the software. In many respects, the software is even more important than the hardware for us humans. And so, as it turns out, societies evolve through these stages in a particular specific order. You can't just jump over a stage. Every society basically evolves up the spiral stages in a particular order. And that's very useful to know because you can then predict what the next stage is and help people to navigate the various traps and problems of each stage. See, so these are like cultural soft pieces of software that that are programmed into our minds as part of being civilized animals, which is what we are. Now, unfortunately, red is not that civilized, as we'll see here. So uh, you can see the spiral dynamics chart. You can see the different stages. Basically, what's happening is that the higher you go up the spiral, your circle of concern for others expands. Your sense of ego becomes more diffuse, and it also expands. The lower the stages, the more contracted the ego, the more selfish the person is, and generally all of the problems that come with ego become more pronounced at the lower stages. And at the lower stages, you have lower levels of consciousness. Basically, at the very lowest stages, it's more like humans behaving like animals. And then at the higher stages, these are more civilized humans, more developed humans, uh, who have more compassion and a larger sense of concern, uh, a deeper, broader morality, and they behave in more humane ways, more like uh, like saints than animals. So what is the essence of stage red? It's this. We could call it egocentric and domine domineering. It's power hungry. It's a mode of survival which is very animalistic in the sense that in the animal kingdom, might makes right. If you can physically attack somebody or you can chase them down and eat them, bite them, scratch them, trick them, exploit them, then you do it as an animal. That's just survival in the animal kingdom. And that's very much what survival looks like at stage red, in stage red societies. It's very exploitative. This stage is individualistic. If you remember, spiral dynamic stages, they oscillate and swing back and forth like a pendulum between individualist stages and collectivist stages. So stage red is individualist, then it's gonna to swing to stage blue, which is gonna be collectivist, then back to stage orange, uh, which is individualist again, and so it, it oscillates this way. So uh, what this means is that stage red is about taking charge without taking into account the suffering of others. It's very, very egocentric. That's why we call it egocentric. It's all about me and my ability to survive and reproduce, and maybe my immediate circle of friends and family. But even there, at stage red, you might be shocked to learn that stage red is so egocentric that it might even hurt and cause suffering to its, uh, to its family members, and even to its closest friends, because it's just so self-absorbed. Stage Red views life as survival in the jungle. The strong will win, and the weak will lose. They tend to see the world as a one divided between victims and predators, and that there's no other alternative but to compete, and uh, Stage Red wants to be the predator, not the victim, of course. It's pretty natural, right? I mean, if you were forced to choose between being a victim and a predator, wouldn't you choose to be a predator? At least that's how Stage Red thinks about it. Stage Red is impulsive, and it looks for immediate gratification of its desires. So if it's horny, it's gonna immediately wanna have sex. Damn the consequences. If it's hungry, it's gonna throw some lavish banquet and gorge itself full of you know, delicacies and the, the best food that it can without thinking of the long-term consequences and so on for the way that it generally approaches life. Stage red 
has neither guilt nor concern for others. This can be a little bit difficult for some of us in developed democracies to appreciate. Those of us who have a higher sense of morality, those of us, like most of you who watch me, are probably at around stage green, maybe high orange, low green, somewhere around there, maybe a little bit above green. So if you're coming and looking at red from that vantage point, the difficulty with this entire episode is for you to understand red, it's gonna be difficult because to you, this, this seems like uh, psychopathy. It seems like craziness. It seems like insanity. It's gonna seem like red is, uh, is just brutal and criminal. Like how, how is it possible that a, a human can have no guilt? or that a human could not care about causing suffering to its immediate family members or to its friends or to, to others. How is that possible? Well, that's because society has enculturated you so well because you had the luxury of standing on the shoulders of giants and growing up in an advanced society which has been evolving for hundreds and thousands of years that now you just take that for granted and you think, that, well, humans just always were compassionate and always were, you know, capable of guilt. And uh, they always, um, you know, treated each other nicely and so forth. No, no. What you have to understand is that the software that runs the human mind and all of human society, this software has been upgrading for hundreds and thousands of years. And it's different in different parts of the world at different times, in different eras. And it transforms how you see the world completely, it's almost like we're talking about living in different realities here, right? So the challenge for you here as you're listening to me is that it, it might seem like what I'm talking about here is, is exaggerated or that it's hyperbolic or that it's grotesque and that it's evil. Many people would consider stage red evil and yet it's not evil. It's not even bad. It just is what survival is like in certain parts and times in the world. And so what you have to really appreciate about red is that red is an effective survival strategy given a specific type of environment. So red usually exists in very brutal environments, very underdeveloped parts of the world where there aren't effective court systems. There is not effective and fair police. There is not a dem democratic government at stage red. Um, there are not human rights. There is not even a notion of morality. There is not a notion of, of uh, the Ten Commandments. There's not a notion or a value of compassion. These sorts of things are luxuries when you're living in a certain type of environment, certain parts of the world, which are very underdeveloped, which all of the world was, 500 years ago or a thousand years ago or 2000 years ago, right? So you have to appreciate that. So one of the things that many stage green and above people fail to appreciate is that the only reason you're at stage green is because your society has developed the infrastructure and the kind of government and culture, thousands of years of cultural evolution have happened to allow you to stand on the shoulders of giants so that you live in this nice, comfortable society where you can have the luxury of compassion for others and where you don't have to worry about somebody stabbing you in the back as you're walking down the street. You don't have to be worried about ro being robbed at gunpoint while you're driving down the highway by some highwaymen. You don't have to worry about pirates because there's police that protect you. But in many parts of the world, there isn't such a thing, or if there is police, these police themselves are stage red and they're part of some criminal mafia and they've been paid off and they're very corrupt. And so unless you're able to pay them off or you're friends with somebody in the, in the police, then they're not gonna help you. And in fact, they will, they will abuse you themselves and exploit you themselves. So we'll get into a lot more of that as we keep going. Uh, stage red has this attitude of challenging death and coming out on top, prevailing. So it tends to be very risk tolerant because it has to be, because the environment it grew up in to survive, it had to take some bold and daring risks. So when does stage red emerge on the spiral? 
basically, if we kind of situate it historically in the evolution of, of human societies, stage purple is the stage that comes before red. And so stage purple is very tribal. Think of it as the prototype is basically uh, tribes of 100 or 200 people living deep in the Amazon jungle, which still exists today. That's how humans lived 5,000 years ago or so. So there are these tribes, and then we tend to have this kind of myth about these tribes, that these tribes are very peaceful. This is sort of the stage green romanticization of these tribes. They're peaceful, they live in harmony with nature, and some of that is true. Uh, but they also tend to be uh, warlike amongst themselves. There's a lot of tribal warfare. And so what starts to happen is that as these stage purple tribes, as they start to expand and grow, there's more of them. You know, at first, if we just, you know, roll the clock back 100,000 years, then these tribes could live more or less peacefully because they were so isolated from each other. And there were the, the environment was so huge. There were so few of these tribes. The population of humans was generally so low. There were so many abundant natural resources, animals to hunt, but you know, buffaloes and, and, and mammoths and all these sorts of things that you could hunt and eat. And it was all plentiful. You could fish and you could, uh, you know, pick fruit and all this. And so uh, there wasn't a lot of need for tribal warfare. But then as these tribes grow, they start to encroach on one another. And then of course, naturally they have to fight over resources and they have different culture, different languages, different ethnicities and so forth. And so the, you start to get clashes and fighting. Now at stage purple, this is a very collectivist stage. And basically when you're living in this tribe, there's no sense of individualism the way that we have today. There's no sense of like this libertarian, I'm an individual and I have personal freedoms and rights. This is not how tribal life works. In a tribal culture, you're basically living as part of the tribal identity. You're basically part of this tribal hive mind. That is your identity, is the tribe. It's not about you, because that's what's necessary for a tribe to survive. They have to work together effectively. But then with stage red, what starts to happen is that once the tribe becomes successful and it, it, it becomes stable uh, and you've sort of mastered cooperating within the tribe, that safety of the tribe, the success of the tribe, then sort of leads to the next stage, which is now the emergence of red. Now, you start to develop a certain sense of individuality and personal ambition. Now, you've sort of lived in the tribe and then you realize, well, okay, the tribal life is nice, but then what do I get for myself? And now I want something for me. I want to control the tribe. What if I become the chieftain of the tribe? What if I overtake and overthrow the chieftain who's already there because I'm more powerful? Then I could get all the women, I could get all the resources, I can get all the money, I can get all the weapons, and I have all the power for myself, and that would be great, right? That's the sort of attitude of Red. And, uh, and also, it might not just be purely selfish like that, but there might also be sort of an altruistic component to it indirectly in the sense that if I have a tribe here, my tribe, and the chieftain of my tribe is not very effective, not very decisive, not very strong, and we have a neighboring tribe that's stronger than us, who already has a stage red chieftain, who's very powerful and bloodthirsty and domineering, the problem is, is that now my tribe is at a serious survival disadvantage. If that tribe overtakes my tribe, my entire tribe will be enslaved or wiped out. So in a sense, there's like an arms race where I am compelled for purposes of just survival. I am compelled to rise, and it's in a sense my duty to overthrow this weak, feeble, ineffective chieftain and to be strong and to fight for my people and to rally my tribe together, maybe rally multiple tribes together, unify them so that we can put up a strong front against this other stage red tribe that will conquer us. See? So there's this pressure to unify squabbling tribes for the greater good, for the survival of the tribe. And that's really what stage red is all about. It's just about pure survival. Uh, if you're sort of shocked by some of the brutality and cruelty of red, as we'll be talking about going forward, uh, don't be, because if red wasn't this brutal, given the environment it has to grow up in, it would probably die. Or it would be severely victimized. 
and its family would suffer deeply. So in a sense, you can start to empathize with Red and, and start to see why Red has this appeal. You know, if you're gonna be put into a corner, if someone's gonna put a, a gun to your children's heads and threaten to pull the trigger, you can see how that might spur you to stop being a victim, stop uh, being nice, take off the kid gloves, and uh, and you know go get your baseball bat sort of thing. And so Red, Red's form of government is gonna be a unification through ruthless domination. And that's how Red emerges from, from purple. Here's a list of stage Red values. I give this list in every one of my episodes. These values are the core of what defines the spiral dynamics stage, any stage. A stage is basically a collection of values. So here's what stage red values. Personal power, strength, might, and brute force. Displays of toughness. Brazen courage, valor, heroism, and daring. Being the boss, being number one, winning at all costs, conquering one's enemies, domination, and Furthermore, it's the thrill of conquest. They actually get off on this. There can be a sort of joy to being strong and powerful and being able to bully others. Stage Red has a warrior mentality. Death is glorified. It's not something that Stage Red fears very much. One of the qualities of Stage Red is that it tends to be fearless. It tends to be daring and bold. It loves heroic deeds. It loves to challenge death and win. It loves competition. It loves to crush its opponents. It values resolving disputes through ruthless force or through intimidation rather than through diplomacy or any kind of soft means like that. So if you want to think of stage green as the soft hippie stage, Stage red is sort of the polar opposite of that, is a very hard, brutal, uh, physical force stage. If you want to think of stage green as having a lot of compassion and being very heart-centered, stage red is very much sort of groin-centered. We might say it's chakra two in this sense. Uh, it's, it's very lusty, it's, uh, it's very primal, it's sort of brutal, it's physical, it's material. Stage red values winning, victory, conquest, and triumph against difficult odds. It values ambition and playing it big. It values revenge, respect, receiving respect, loyalty, loyalty to me, to the boss, decisiveness, assertiveness, passion, action. It's a very action-oriented stage. It's pragmatic, it's direct, it's no nonsense. It's about taking initiative and ownership and personal willpower. Getting things done and a sort of just do it mentality. So stage red is not gonna sit around and think things through very deeply. It's just gonna say, fuck it, let's just do it. Let's just do it and deal with the consequences, whatever they are, and sometimes the consequences are are very bloody and terrible and catastrophic, and uh, and then Red adjusts to that. It's a very much sort of a fly by the seat of your pants, uh, shoot first, ask questions later sort of mentality. Stage Red values unilateral control and executive power. It values glitz, ostentation dis ostentatious displays, of grandiosity. It wants to be bigger than life. So what I mean by glitz and ostentation displays of, of grandiosity is, uh, think of a Roman emperor who has conquered some some barbaric tribe and then they build, you know, the, the Roman Empire builds this giant, uh, elaborate, very expensive monument that takes 10 years to build, so, you know, some sort of obelisk or some sort of giant statue where it shows the emperor, you know, with his muscles and a spear and he's standing on top of the corpse, you know, a pile of corpses of his enemies that he's conquered. That sort of 
display of ostentation and grandiosity. And of course, he's depicted as this larger than life hero with giant muscles, the perfect physique and, you know, big weapons. And it's all covered in gold, made out of solid gold, something like that. You know, just imagine, <laughs> imagine the most grandiose uh, sort of uh, monument to, to conquest. And, uh, and, and you can see this all throughout the, you know, the Roman Empire, for example, or other ancient civilizations. We see these sorts of uh, sculptures and reliefs and uh, monuments. And, uh, of course, th this will come with, with myths and stories that glorify the conquest of, of our enemies. Stage Red values status and recognition of prowess. It values machismo, pride, and bragging, charisma, and it tends to be a plain talker. Rather than being very intellectual, like some of the higher stages, this, uh, this, this stage tends to be plain spoken and very blunt and direct and brutal. It tends to be quite vulgar in its speech. It's not very refined or educated. A stage red person probably doesn't have very much education. It values intimidation, manipulation, and exploitation as survival. And it actually gets off on this. It sort of delights in being able to intimidate or manipulate or exploit somebody who's weaker than it. It values sexual conquest and exploitation. And it tends to use sex, not just for sex or procreation, but for, for power and vanity. It tends to value sadistic forms of sex. Sex that involves torture and domination and exploitation and inflicting suffering. It's about enjoying life to the fullest. Damn the consequences. It tends to value adventure, thrill-seeking, and living boldly. It values power contests like uh, arm wrestling, face slapping. <laughs> There's this interesting trend on YouTube. I heard about it on Joe Rogan. Um, he showed some clips of, of the, these guys, these Russian guys who will do these, uh, slapping contests. You can, you can Google it, type in slapping contest, something like that, and you'll see it. Basically, it's like usually two giant beefy dudes standing face to face across from each other in front of a, a little table. And they just take, they basically get, uh, one turn after another, just to slap each other across the face as hard as possible. Like sometimes they will slap each other so hard that they will knock the other guy out just from, from the sheer force of that slap. So that, that's an example of, of a very sort of uh, stage red sort of mentality. And you can see the people who are there, just you can look at their complexions, like the tattoos they have and just the way they talk and everything. You, you can just tell it's a very stage red vibe. Stage red values breaking rules and finding loopholes. It's not very good at following rules or obeying or being orderly. That's something that comes with stage blue, which hasn't emerged yet. And it values breaking with the pack and pushing the envelope. So here are some more characteristics of stage red. It strives for self-preservation and respect. It feels very insulted when it doesn't get the respect that it deserves. It enjoys self to the fullest without regret or remorse. It's free of guilt and shame. It's indifferent to the collateral damage or suffering caused to others. And this is one of those points where, this is one of these points that will be difficult for, for many of you to accept. How is it possible that someone can just go through life and not think about the suffering that one's actions inflict upon others. Uh, to a stage green person, this seems like insanity. This seems like a mental disorder, but it's not necessarily a mental disorder. In many parts of the world, it's just not a luxury that you have. You have to survive no matter what, because in many parts of the world, if you're living in a, in a difficult environment, like you're living somewhere in some very impoverished part of Africa or in the Middle East, uh, the reality is that if you do care about the suffering of others too much, 
and you care about the collateral damage that your actions inflict, you're simply not going to survive. Your family is not going to survive. So in a sense, you're forced into it. You don't very, you don't have very much option. Um, another characteristic of stage reds, it, it tends to be narcissistic. And uh, sometimes narcissism in our society is thought of as this mental disorder. But not necessarily is it just a mental disorder. It could just simply be a fact of a lack of development. Many people who, for example, might immigrate from a third world country into a first world country, they might appear narcissistic because they simply come from an environment where they had to be extremely selfish and ego-centered in order to survive, in order to get to where they are. So it's not necessarily a, a mental disorder. Don't think of stage red as a mental disorder. Uh, the reason that is is because if you if you, there are societies where stage red is just prevalent, and it makes no sense to say that these people have a mental disorder because they can evolve out of that if they do work and if you know society is given more time to develop and infrastructure is built, they grow out of it. So it's not just a mental disorder. Um, another characteristic of red is that it tends to be impulsive rather than strategic. So there's no deep strategy behind stage red's actions. It tends to go by its gut feel. It tends to be intuitive and not so much analytical or academic. It doesn't make very long-term deep plans. And of course, that can get into trouble because its time horizon is very short. It tends to be very myopic. It tends to be very opportunistic and it tends to just try to do whatever it can do now in order to survive because that's do you see how when you're living in a very challenging survival situation it doesn't make sense to spend a lot of your energy thinking about what's going to happen five years or ten years down the road because you just have to survive this week that's all you're concerned about in these kinds of environments now if you're living in a, in a first world country then you have the luxury to think about what's going to happen in five years and 10 years, you know, to plan out your life because you can predict life is more stable and predictable and society is not all chaos and it's not war. Um, but when you're like living in the mafia, for example, you don't have some five year, 10 year plan. You're just living for tomorrow. You're just trying to make sure you don't get caught by the cops tomorrow. You're trying to make sure you don't get hit. You know, some hit isn't issued on you next week. And as long as you can survive that, then you'll deal with the next problem, you know, when it arises. But of course, the problem with this approach is that you can get yourself painted into a corner very easily. You can sort of go down and down a downward negative spiral, which then just completely spirals out of control and it's, it's unsustainable and then you just get killed. Another characteristic is that red uses power for per personal gratification and enrichment. It uses force fear and intimidation to govern. There's no democracy at stage red. This is absolute totalitarianism, tyranny, authoritarianism, strong arming others. There's a glorification of absolute rules and vengeful gods. Stage red can believe in God, a lot of stage red dictators and so forth, they actually do believe in God, but the gods they believe in are the sort of gods that are convenient to their lifestyle. So this is a God that actually encourages war. This is a God that encourages celebration of conquest and things like this. So their, theirs is not some peaceful, loving God. Theirs is a God who respects others who are strong and who conquer their enemies and then therefore they now they deserve the respect of God because to them, that's what God is. God is this vengeful authoritarian ruler of the universe. And of course, they're trying to emulate God in that sense. There's a glorification of war, rape, genocide, and enslavement. These things are not considered to be bad. And uh, that's that's a very difficult one for many of us in developed parts of the world to wrap our minds around, you know, like how could someone consider rape 
to not be bad? How could someone consider enslavement uh, you know, how, to, to be a positive? How can someone glorify war? These things are horrible. But these things are also extremely common at stage red. They are just a way of life. That's how you survive in a stage red society in many places. Life is cheap and people are expendable to stage red. Survival is so difficult that people are dying all the time. For example, if you're part of the mob, you know many people who, you know, your friends and so forth, and your bosses who have been killed, put in jail. And this is just a normal part of your life. You're, you're in a sense, you're sort of jaded and desensitized to it because there's no other way. Stage red societies are not peaceful societies. And the people you hang out with, stage red people, you know, they're, they're generally violent, uh, narcissistic sort of people. And so it's all about, you know, how do I use somebody else to get myself ahead? Relationships tend to be transactional and expendable. So stage green, you know, puts a lot of effort into actually cultivating relationships and getting satisfaction and value out of just the relationship itself, a relationship for its own sake. Red doesn't think this way. Red doesn't have that luxury. A relationship is something I'm using in order to advance my survival. Red tends to be oblivious to other sentient beings with rights and personal worth. Red basically treats other humans in the way that humans treat uh, animals that they eat, in the way that we treat factory farmed cows and pigs and chickens, right? How much time do you spend thinking about the rights and personal worth of a chicken? Not very much. You just kill it and you eat it. And that's generally the sort of approach that stage red takes to other humans. Now, of course, if you're stage green, you say, no, Leo, but I'm a vegan and I care so much about animal rights and the worth of animals and they are sentient beings. <laughs> well, good, good for you. You've evolved to a certain level of consciousness, but uh, don't expect others to be at that same level. And you have to understand that, that what you're doing is not some you know, it's not some absolute truth. That, that's, that, that's part of your value system. That's part of something that you're constructing, is you're constructing this sort of idea that, that sentient beings have value and personal worth and that we need to respect life. This is, a, this is a relative value system. There's no reason that you need to respect life. It's just, a, I mean, it's nice if you do. It creates a nicer society. It's easier to live that way. But, but, but don't go thinking that there's, there's some sort of absolute truth behind that. There's not. It's relative. Another characteristic of red tends to be that they're, they're gutsy, they're ballsy, they're cocky, and they have a very high risk tolerance. So a lot of gamblers, you know, like degenerate, chronic gamblers will be stage red because they don't, they don't think about the consequences uh, they don't think about the odds and they get a thrill out of, out, you know, placing these high stakes bets and then winning, even though they're probably going to lose. But if they do win, you know, that, that gives them that sort of adrenaline rush and it gives them that sense of, of power, sort of beating the system, beating the odds. Um, a lot of red survival strategy is about winning through sheer audacity. It's an interesting survival strategy. Have you ever maybe experience this in your life, sometimes you think like, well, I can sort of take the safe road in this situation. Like you could say, it's a dangerous situation here. So I could be conservative and take the safe road. Or I can, you know, do the very risky thing. And you, you think about the risky thing and most of us think about it like, nah, it's just too dangerous. Because if it goes wrong, it will really, really go wrong. Um... And so we generally go the conservative direction and we stay safe that way. But stage red, in a sense, it's so bold, it's so daring, it's so shameless that a lot of times it can win simply through its sheer shamelessness. Have you known people like that? 
Um, yeah, it, it's definitely a survival strategy that sometimes works. You know, I've heard stories of people, sage red people, you know, who describe some of their, you know, daring, risk taking, uh, audacious, uh, you know, things that they've done. And, you know, I think about it like, damn, you're crazy. That That's insane. You could have killed yourself. You could have gotten arrested. You could have, you know, overdosed. You could have, um, you could have killed yourself, you know, you, whatever. Uh, but, uh, but the reason that they didn't is precisely because they were so audacious. A lot of times you can exploit people that way because a lot of times people don't expect you to be suicidally daring. And yet when you are, for example, you could win on the battlefield. If you're, if you're fighting a battle against some opponent and you're completely outnumbered, what do you got to do? Well, you don't have much to lose because, you know, you're so outnumbered, you know they're going to come and kill you. So you might as well just go for the most bold and daring plan. And sometimes it works out precisely because your enemy doesn't expect you to be so daring and so bold. And that's exactly why Red uh, uses this strategy. Because it works in a certain type of environment. You have to really appreciate that the environment that these strategies are played in is 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 completely fundamental because if you have a mismatch between the environment and the strategy you're using then it's going to turn out terrible but if the environment and the strategy is the right fit then it'll work even if it's brutal or it seems insane to you another characteristic of red is that it tends to only trust itself because of course everybody is in this sort of dog eat dog world it's a, it's a jungle out there. And so who can I really trust? Well, nobody, because anybody could stab me in the back and everybody's going to try to exploit me just the way that I, explo I exploit them. And so one of the ways in which Red justifies its predatory and exploitative behavior is because, hey, everybody else is doing it. So why should I be the only one who disarms when all of my enemies are arming themselves up? Well, I have to as well. It's an arms race. Another characteristic is that Whatever I can take is fair. It's this attitude of I am the law. I set the law. Might makes right. If I can do it, then that means it's justified. I don't have to hold myself back with guilt and morality and artificial rules of what's right and what's wrong. If I can do it, it's right. Red has a high sense of entitlement. It feels like it owns the world. It deserves women and sex and money and fame and respect. All of this is deserved. Which makes Red very confident. It's decisive and energetic. It's very direct and blunt. It's quick to action. Red tends to be hot-blooded emotions such as rage, anger, mania. Red will fly off the handle if it's triggered enough. Red will throw objects at the wall. You know, <laughs> those people who, you know, they're, they're in a fight, they get angry, they, they take some vase or something and they, they smash it against their partner's head or something like that. <laughs> or they, they will throw a glass in their face, these sorts of things. A lot of domestic violence comes from stage red men and even stage red women. A, straight, a stage red woman, uh, and by the way, stage red is not just exclusive to men. Women, of course, are also able to be at stage red. I'll give you some examples of that as we get to the examples portion of this episode. But, you know, there, there's examples of, of crazy women who are alcoholic and do drugs and they, they are abusive to their boyfriends and husbands and they will try to stab them or throw something at them or shoot them. So there's, there's, <laughs> there's plenty of these examples to go around. Uh, stage red tends to be materialistic and hedonistic. It, it values tangible things, gold, diamonds, drugs, uh, sex, uh, you know, trophy women and wives and this, like this sorts of stuff, stuff that you can, that, that, you know, that you can, that you can use directly for your survival. Red likes to flex its muscles as a show of its strength, it likes to puff itself up, you know, puff up its chest and, and beat its chest, this sort of attitude. It tends to be pragmatic, action-oriented, and results-oriented. 
It's very opportunist, opportunistic and um, expedient. Whatever is expedient, whatever will work in this situation, it tends to, to do. Because it's forced to. It expects personal loyalty and respect. Uh, it uses shows of power and guts to gain respect from others. It delights in cruelty, torture, revenge, and violence. So not only is it that Red can be very violent and do all these sorts of criminal things, but it actually takes delight in it. Not always, but oftentimes it can. It tends to be very vindictive and delights in the suffering, especially of its enemies. So if some enemy did me wrong, uh, stage red people will have very long-term memory. They will hold a grudge for any insult that they received, and they're easily insulted because they value respect so much. You know, um, they can be disrespected easily, and then they will hold that grudge for years, for decades, until they can exact their revenge on their enemies and make it as, as painful for them as possible. And they will gloat and delight in that. And then they will, they will glorify that and they will share that with their, you know, with their friends and their enemies so that it's like a threat. You know, if you mess with me, I'm going to cut off your head and put on a spike sort of idea. There's no altruism at stage red. There's no forgiveness. There's no compromise. There's no mercy. It tends to be ruthless and bloodthirsty. There's celebration of conquest. Rules and regulations are to be tested and ignored, not to be followed. Red likes to bend nature to its will. So not only is red about dominating humans, but also dominating the environment, physically, you know, raping the earth, so to speak extracting resources, um, dominating animals as well. Red doesn't have the capacity for self-reflection. All problems in the world are perceived to be external. So there's no inner work going on at stage red. There's no consciousness work. It's not like stage red will stop and will ask itself, well, did I do the right thing in that situation when I killed that guy or when I robbed that bank or when I did those drugs. It's like, no, the problem isn't me. The problem is never me. The problem is always that, oh, it's the police who are the problem. It's the government who's the problem. It's the woman who's the problem. You know, she made me slap her and rape her because of what she was wearing and because she was disrespecting me. So of course I raped her because she was disrespecting me. She got what she deserved. That's the sort of idea. It's never like, well, what about me? What about my, is there anything in my psyche that I should change? Should I do some self-improvement? <laughs> like, no, not a stage red. Problems are always somebody else's fault. And stage red doesn't learn through punishment. So a lot of criminals will be repeat offenders and they will be sent in jail over and over again. They get released, they get caught again because they just go back to doing what they were doing because Punishment doesn't deter them, and they don't think that far ahead. When they're thinking about holding up, you know, a liquor store at gunpoint for a thousand dollars or something, all they want is that thousand dollars because they need that thousand dollars, you know, to buy some heroin to feed their drug addiction or whatever. And they're not thinking about, well, what are the consequences? What what if cops come and then you know the the judge throws the book at me and I get 10, 20 years in jail? It's like they, no, they don't they don't make those connections. So of course they're gonna just. Um, uh, they're going to seem very unintelligent to higher stages. And in a sense, they are. And, you know, they're impulsive. So it's like, if I'm horny and I want to have sex and, you know, there's that, that girl walking by, well, I'm just going to rape her and I'm not going to think about the consequence. I'm going to think about, will I get caught? How many years am I going to go to jail for rape? You know, I'm not going to go Google that and, and try to figure it out and see like, well, is it worth, let, let me do a cost benefit analysis on, you know, well, I could get five years for raping her. But on the other hand, I'm really horny. Like, which one of those should I like? No, it's like, oh, I'm horny. I'm just going to rape her. And then if the cops come, I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, I'm going to, I'm going to find where their, those cops live and uh, I'm going to go and break the kneecaps of their, uh, of their children with, with a baseball bat. Teach them a lesson. 
this kind of mentality. Because there's no self-reflection here, there's an instant defensiveness when ideas are challenged. Because stage red is so brashly self-confident that it doesn't recognize the weakness of its own plans or ideas. So when someone tells stage red, like, hey, you know, that's a bad idea. Maybe you shouldn't go through with that. Stage red is going gonna, is gonna to tend to not introspect and say, yeah, you know, maybe you're right. Maybe I shouldn't rob that bank. Maybe I should get out of the mafia. It's like, no, it's like, who are you to challenge me? You're questioning my ideas. You're disrespecting me. You're telling me that there's something wrong with me. It's like, no, something's wrong with you because all problems are external. Nothing's wrong with me. Of course, there's very high ego at this stage. And because there's high ego, stage red is not capable of looking at itself objectively, of objectively evaluating its own weaknesses and trying to improve itself. And so that's a big problem. How do you get people out of stage red? How do you get them to, to rehabilitate themselves like as criminals or as drug addicts, for example? How do you get them to change when they don't want to do any self-improvement work? And everything at this stage is taken personally. So if you tell a stage red person to do some self-improvement work, they're going to take that personally, like there's something wrong with them. They're going to get angry, and they're probably going to lash out at you, and they're probably going to hit you over the head. And they're going to be happy about it. Stage red is unable to exercise restraint. There's a lack of self-control. Self-control and discipline is something that's developed at stage blue, which comes next after stage red, but we haven't gotten there yet. So there's a lack of self-control. A lot of the stupid stuff that stage red, red does tends to end up boomeranging on, on it because it just acts impulsively on on some craving or some desire it has, and then it gets itself into a bad, uh, dangerous situation, which ends up harming its survival. It's unable to plan well. It's unable to save for a rainy day or do preventative maintenance work. It tends to be very corrupt, and uh, it sees corruption and violence as the norm. It doesn't see corruption as a bad thing that needs to be reformed. It's just the way of life. Because some countries and societies are so corrupt that the idea of ever correcting that corruption is so far out into the future that it doesn't even make sense to think about it because it won't happen in your lifetime. So why think about it? Join the corruption and try to win that game of corruption and come out on top. Be the most corrupt. That's how Red thinks. You don't deal with corruption by, by being nice. You deal with corruption by becoming even more corrupt than everybody else. Red tends to be about controlling and expanding turf and territory. That's what a lot of uh, gang warfare is about. You know, different rival gangs in inner cities are fighting with each other for control of territory in order to sell drugs, for example. And if you disrespect a gang member, you get killed. By a, through like a drive-by shooting or something. Stage red can get off on controlling people because it, it, it loves to be dominate, domineering. And so just its whole approach to life is to control others, to make them do what red needs and wants for its survival. Aggression and violence are seen as legit tools to get what red wants. Red tends to be passionate. It tends to have a, a, a passionate sense of mission. It tends to be a sort of an alpha male mentality. Although that doesn't mean that red is exclusive to males. Females, like I said, are also capable of it. It tends to be very confrontational. It doesn't back down. It creates enemies, and it sees the world in terms of friends and enemies. Enemies are not seen as something that my mind is projecting or creating. 
enemies are not relative or subjective things the way that you realize they are at higher stages. Enemies are real, tangible, and they must be destroyed. Red tends to be independent. It tends to like a strict hierarchy where red is in charge or red is climbing the hierarchy to the top to become the boss. Now, don't make a mistake, think of, uh, mistake here of thinking that you must be the boss in order to be stage red. For example, in a gang or in a mafia, everybody in, in a sort of, you know, soprano style mafia situation, everybody, not just Tony Soprano, but everybody in that structure is stage red. You have the highest boss, maybe Tony Soprano, of course he's red, but there's lower, you know, his lieutenants, they're also red, and, and everybody underneath them is also red. But then, of course, you know, it's, it's a vicious sort of hierarchy where one is trying to climb the ladder and trying to take out the guy above. Or if one respects the guy above you, then you sort of respect his power. And so, you know, red is not totally stupid. Red can understand that, you know, maybe I'm not the strongest one in this hierarchy. Maybe I have to bide my time a little bit. I can't just go challenge the boss right away. Maybe right now I'm just sort of a newbie. I'm sort of just a lieutenant. I can, I can respect the boss because the boss is powerful. So don't think that Red will never submit himself to some higher power. He will. He will submit himself to a boss. But of course, Red respects the boss precisely because he wants to sort of be in that boss's shoes. Now, that doesn't mean that he will ever get there. He probably won't because there's not that many bosses. There can only be so many bosses relative to everybody down lower on the pyramid. But you can sort of maintain that structure. And then the boss, the way the boss enforces that structure is through an iron fist, through, you know, brutal torture and domination, such that that keeps others in line. And Red respects that. Uh, another feature of Red is that it tends to view conquest as equivalent to worth, value, truth, goodness, and beauty. So for most of us, if we're a little bit more developed than that, uh, we can have values like truth and goodness and beauty, and we can value these, and we don't equate these with conquest and domination of other people. But Stage Red does, and you can see how problematic that can be. And lastly, a characteristic of Stage Red is that it tends to exploit the superstitions of Stage Purple. So Stage Purple, which we'll talk about in the future, not only is it deeply tribal, but it tends to have a sort of a magical, animistic, mystical, spiritual component to it. Um, a lot of sort of superstition, witchcraft, voodoo, this sorts of stuff, which can be exploited by Stage Red for its own purposes. Because Stage Red is not going to be loyal to some, you know, Mother Earth spirit or some, some shit like this. Uh, but it could exploit that in order to, to dominate and to control other people. All right, so now it's time to get to my giant list of examples of Stage Red. A lot of examples here. We're going to go through them quickly. I'll pause on certain examples in order to elaborate. Because some of these examples are, are really illustrative of Red. So let's start with the first one, uh, which is Donald Trump. So I've alluded to this in the past, but it really bears to, to, to double down on it here. Hopefully, if you're conscious and you've been following Sprout Dynamics and you've been following what's been happening in politics over the last four years, you've been sort of psychoanalyzing Trump. Uh, and a lot of the stuff that I already mentioned, all these values and qualities, as I was mentioning them, I hope in your mind you were seeing an image of Trump because I was describing him almost word for word in many ways. Uh, he loves to brag. He loves displays of power, military parades. He is friends with other dictators and authoritarians around the world. Um, he's extremely impulsive. He has no self-control. He has no discipline. Uh, he's very manipulative and exploitative, opportunistic. He doesn't have long-term plans. He's not a strategic thinker. He's not a systemic thinker. He's just flying by the seat of his pants. He's very intuitive. He's driven by his gut. Um, he's simple-minded. He's not very educated. He will say the dumbest things. He wants respect more than anything. He gets easily offended. 
He has a very fragile ego. He's extremely narcissistic. He doesn't care about anybody, not even his own family members. Many of them he doesn't care about, um, not even his own sons. Uh, if you've read, you know, stories, inside stories of, of how the Trump family operates, it's a very stage red sort of mentality. Now, of course, Trump is not exclusively stage red. He's also got elements of some blue and he's got plenty of stage orange in him as well. Uh, but he's got a lot of stage red. And uh, the problem with Trump is that he got elected by people who are not very bright and are not able to make these distinctions. They have no idea what spiral dynamics is. And so they elected him, including most of the Republican Party. They started to support Trump uh, thinking that he's at stage orange. I mean, they don't understand what stage orange is. But if they did, they would think, oh yeah, he's just a stage orange, like CEO, successful business guy, likes money, you know, has a has giant high rises with golden toilets and stuff like that. Yeah, he's just sort of like an excessively stage orange sort of guy. We can deal with that, you know, because most most Republicans and most people who, um, you know, neoliberals and capitalists, they're stage orange. But what they don't understand is that Trump has a thin veneer of stage orange, but deep down at his core, in his psyche, he's stage red, which is two stages lower than orange, it's far more dangerous. And so now, four years into it, Republicans have sort of been shocked themselves to see how incompetent and reckless and dangerous Trump is, how uncontrollable he is, how little discipline he has. And to many Republicans, it's kind of like they've, they've gone all in on Trump because they want to maintain power, but they're not quite able to reconcile, like, why does this guy act like such a monster sometimes? Why can't he just, like, be normal? Why can't he be a normal Republican? Why can't he just be the sort of normal stage blue slash orange sort of Republican the way that mo most of them are? Uh, well, because he's actually got a very deep red core. And, uh, and see, you can't, you can't train him. You can't teach him. He doesn't learn lessons. He just keeps acting impulsively from his narcissistic impulses. And this offends some conservatives. The good conservatives, the sort of never Trumpers, they saw through it. They had some morals and some integrity, and they saw that this guy is not a standard Republican. This guy is actually hijacking the, the conservative movement. Uh, you know, he's not truly religious. He doesn't respect, mor he doesn't have any morality. He's a serial, you know, womanizer and philanderer. And, you know, there's rape accusations against him and blah, 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 blah. And so, you know, he, you know, he, 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 he engages in, in criminal business activity. He's not really able to run a successful business. So he's not, he's not going to lead us to any kind of, you know, um, sort of neoliberal ideal that many conservatives have. It's, it's not going to happen. So the narrow Trumpers saw through that, credit to them. Um, but many conservatives and Republicans haven't. And in fact, they've, they've sort of been pulled by Trump deeper into red themselves. Trump brings out the red in, in many conservatives. And I think many conservatives do have an, a tinge of red in them, you know, some more than others. But the danger is, is that Trump stokes that up. And because birds of a feather flock together, other stage red people, you know, they get activated. So we have more hate crime. Racism has now sort of Sort of started to 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 come out from from the shadows into the open with Trump because you know he's been kind of encouraging it and he's been so sort of brash and and blunt about it. Um, and you can tell. I mean, uh, the biggest problem with Trump is simply he has no compassion. He has no concern for the collateral damage or suffering that his actions cause towards anybody, not even his uh, closest friends and 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 colleagues. And, and family members, right? So that's the biggest problem with Trump. Um, you can't run an effective society and community at the sort of level of complexity that America is at now. You know, we're not some, some banana republic. Uh, we're not some 
some underdeveloped country in in Africa. You know, we're a country with nuclear weapons and you know <laughs> space travel and satellites and complex military systems and all this sorts of stuff. Um, so you know, as Americans, um, we need a leader who's able to think strategically, systemically. Trump is incapable of this. He's utterly incompetent at this. He doesn't understand how government works. He doesn't care to understand how government works. You can't even brief him on anything because you need to, you need to, you know, whittle down a 20 page report to like a single one page sheet and half of it has to be graphics and the other half has to be telling him how good he is, how great he is, you know, praising his ego, stoking his ego. And because he has no compassion, he doesn't understand uh, what a leader needs in America is the leader needs to have compassion for the suffering of others. Trump doesn't doesn't give a shit about the suffering of the poor, minorities, the middle class. Like he doesn't care about any of this stuff. It's all just pretend. And he's a great con artist. You know, he he likes to talk about God and protecting um protecting religious freedoms and being anti-abortion and all this. He doesn't, this isn't, this is just, it's just a he's just running a con. He's saying these things because he's done some A, B split testing to figure out that that's what these suckers want. That's what you conservatives want, is him to talk about this stuff. He doesn't actually care about these things. But hey, you know, conservatives are in denial about it. If you're a Trump supporter, you're going to deny everything I said here. Uh, you know, but... Um, it is what it is. That's why Spiral Dynamics is such a powerful model. Really, one of the greatest disservices that the media, mainstream media, did during the election leading up to Trump in 2015 and 16 is that they didn't properly make these distinctions for ordinary people. Really, what should have happened is that CNN, MSNBC, even Fox News should have basically been running and saying, look, this guy he seems like he's a stage orange, successful businessman, CEO type of person. He's not. He's actually stage red. So be very, very careful not to confuse him with that. See, if this distinction was properly made to, to mainstream people, then Trump wouldn't have gotten elected because people would have foreseen all the challenges that, that came and all the problems, you know, and how, how reckless he would have been as a leader. But the reason these distinctions weren't made is because the people at CNN, Fox News, and MSNBC and, and other places, they themselves are just completely ignorant about spiral dynamics. They themselves are incapable of making this distinction. It still baffles me to this day, four years into it, I see people you know, on CNN or so forth, um, or even on YouTube, I see progressives even talking about Trump, but they're still not able to clearly differentiate Trump from standard conservatives and Republicans who are more stage blue, orange than red. And then they're shocked by some of the stuff that Trump does. It's not shocking when you understand he's stage red. He's behaving exactly as you would expect him to behave. And this is why a lot of times progressives will tend to call Trump a fascist and Trump call Trump supporters fascists. Um, It's because the reason they're calling him a fascist is because they're they're intuiting, they're sort of seeing his stage red qualities, but they don't know what red is. They don't have that label in their mind. So the only label they have is fascist, so they call him fascist or they call him a Nazi or something like this, which is not strictly correct. In a sense, Trump is, <laughs> is in a sense, he's almost like below a fascist um, in his development. But also somewhere around there, I mean, he's too he's too uneducated to really be an effective fascist. But he certainly has has these stage red authoritarian narcissistic tendencies, which is basically where fascism uh, stems from. But also fascism incorporates a lot of stage blue elements into it as well. Um, so that's just Trump as an example. Saddam Hussein is another very good example. I have a book on my book list about it's a biography about Saddam Hussein and. It clearly illustrates Saddam Hussein's rise from a stage purple tribal culture into stage red and how he took power. It's an amazing book. Go read it and you will learn a lot about stage red and Saddam Hussein. Very, very interesting. I also shared recently on my blog an HBO slash BBC uh, miniseries 
uh, it's, it's sort of a fictionalized, but also sort of a true uh, dramatic reenactment of, of Saddam Hussein's rise to power. Amazing. One of, the, one of the best shows that HBO and the BBC has ever produced um, that sort of flew under the radar and not many people know about it. Go, go check it out. It's called House of Sodom. Amazing show. It shows you how, how stage red works. And in that show, also, you get to see Saddam Hussein's sons, especially one of his sons. I forget, was it Uday or Kuse? I don't know exactly which one of them, but one of them was like just utterly brutal. Like he, he ran Saddam's torture, <laughs> torture division. Um, and this guy was just like a, a, a bloodthirsty psychopath. There, there's this one scene in House of Sodom where... Uh, in the royal compound, you know, some of some of one of Saddam's, you know, younger friends and and sort of collaborators and colleagues, he's throwing this party. It's like a wedding party or something, and it's late at night, and they're kind of rowdy, and they're they're drinking and they're dancing and all this. And then Saddam's sons are like sitting upstairs in the, in the building in the palace, just like talking, um, and they get annoyed by this by this noise coming from this wedding party down below. So they go down there, and um, and the guy is just drunk. The guy is drunk, and he's you know he's singing loudly, um, and uh, and Saddam's son, you know the, the torture guy, <laughs> he says you know turn off the music. This party is over. Uh, shut it all down. You know we want to sleep or something like that. You guys are making too much noise. But the drunk guy's like, no, we have permission from Saddam to hold this party, so we're going to enjoy ourselves. You know, blah blah blah, and. Uh, and so the son takes his cane and just beats the guy over the head to death and just like cracks his skull open, just like it beats him and his brains just are splattered all over like the uh, the concrete there. And the crowd, you know, the wedding party crowd is standing there just aghast at, at what's happening. And the guy just beats his brain into a pulp on the concrete floor. There you go. <laughs> and, and, then, and then he goes back upstairs, uh, you know, Saddam's son, and, and he, he's now he's terrified because this was... This was Saddam Hussein's like top favorite advisors. And now he knows Saddam Hussein is going to be pissed off that he killed this guy for such a stupid reason. So this is an example of sort of stage red, you know, impulsive uh, anger and, and just, you know, hot temper, that hot bloodedness. And so then he tries to, Saddam's son, you know, he's trying to figure out a way, you know, how am I going to, how am I going to deal with this? Because Saddam Hussein's going to be, you know, like, coming here and kicking my ass for this. Um, he thought Saddam would kill him for what he did. So he took a bunch of sleeping pills and then he wound up in the hospital. He survived, but anyways, you know, he, he himself was, was terrified of what he did. So he sort of recognized after the fact that what he did was, was very dangerous and problematic. So uh, regions in the world that are stage red or have a lot of stage red in them is Iraq, Syria, uh, Liberia, I posted a video about Liberia on my blog a while a while ago. Uh, vicious, vicious, vicious. Go go check out the Liberia video. It'll it'll shock you how how um wow <laughs> very stage red. Uh, Somalia, North Korea, Myanmar, Turkmenistan, Haiti, uh, many parts of Africa that are underdeveloped. Uh, the Middle East, many parts of the Middle East that are underdeveloped. Palestine. Um, leaders like Hitler, Stalin. Uh, basically any kind of warlords, uh, mafia, of course, I've talked about Tony Soprano, Al Capone, pirates, marauders, gangs of various kinds, Yakuza, which is the Japanese gang, uh, violent prisoners, uh, tend to be stage red people. Prison culture in general is stage red. You know, they tell you, you know, when you go into prison, there's that whole kind of uh, I don't know if it's true or not. I guess it's true. When you go into prison, you're supposed to like beat somebody up on the first day in order to gain the respect of everybody else. Otherwise, they're going to make you your their, their bitch. It's probably true. I don't know. Uh, sounds true for stage red. Uh, freedom fighters tend to be stage red. Revolutionaries, criminals, rapists, con artists, thieves, terrorists, juvenile delinquents. Ancient Rome had a lot of stage red in it. Gladiatorial combat, very stage red. Emperors like Caligula, Nero, and there are others, other Roman emperors who qualify as stage red. The Spartans were very warlike, militaristic as a people. Uh, Chinese emperors, certain ones, Japanese emperors. Mm. Uh, 
that sort of samurai code, it, it was deeply staged blue as well. Samurais are sort of in between red and blue, I would say. Uh, Alexander the Great, who was a great conqueror. Achilles, who was a great fighter. If you've seen the movie Troy, the depiction of Achilles there is really good. He's, he's this amazing fighter and warrior, but on the other hand, he has a hot temper. He's very sort of proud of his victories and conquests. Um, uh, so he sort of exemplifies sort of the noble image. If you want sort of a, a noble archetype of stage red, it might be Achilles or Alexander the Great. Klingons, the Klingons from Star Trek. I've mentioned this before, but Star Trek, the different races in Star Trek were actually created by the creator of Star Trek, uh, Gene Roddenberry. He studied spiral dynamics, the early version of it developed by Claire Graves. He studied Claire Graves and he knew the different stages and he basically built these different ra alien races like the Klingons and the Romulans and so forth based on different spiral stages. And so the Klingons were the red ones. They have this very warrior culture. They love to be rowdy and rough and they drink and they sing and they, um, uh, you know, they're sort of these barbarians. They're not very educated. They, they tend to act from the gut, shoot first, ask questions later. Online hackers who do all sorts of hacking scams and schemes are stage red. Toxic narcissists, sociopaths, psychopaths. Now, I don't want to say that psychopaths and sociopaths are necessarily and nar are necessarily automatically red, but there's definitely overlap there. I'm not quite sure how to distinguish those. Honestly, my specialty is not um, pathological psychology, so I don't really know. And you could probably draw a lot of very fine distinctions between sociopaths, psychopaths, and stage red, but that would be a topic for another day. Lone shooters and mass shooters, these gunmen that we see on the news in America so often these days, these are mostly stage red folks who get very angry and then they, they take it out. They take their anger out on others. Conan the Barbarian, that movie, and that uh, fictional character. Joe Pesci from Casino. Oh man, if you want uh, a rendition of Stage Red, which is just perfect prototypical Stage Red, Joe Pesci from Casino. I posted some uh, some videos of this on my blog and also on the forum in the mega thread of Spiral Dynamics examples. We have some, some clips of Joe Pesci. Just <laughs> viciously red. Uh, the Russian Mob. Toxic masculinity, some elements of the red pill. Philosophy is stage red. Vikings, Genghis Khan, Mongol hordes, drug addicts, gamblers, criminals, uh, the criminal underground, war criminals, massacres, torch, torture, rape gangs, wild rock stars tend to be red. They do a lot of drugs, stuff like that. Um, I think uh, Russell Brand, in his early days, when he was like doing heroin and stuff like that, that was probably stage red. And now he's evolved very beautifully. So if you want a really good example of how you evolve out of stage red, uh, look at Russell Brand. Jules from Pulp Fiction. Samuel L. Jackson character from Pulp Fiction is a great example of red. And he has a nice story arc. Basically, Jules' story arc in Pulp Fiction is going from red, from a red gangster to a stage blue finding God. Joffrey from Game of Thrones, Ramsay from Game of Thrones, Cersei from Game of Thrones, the Dothraki from Game of Thrones. The Joker, cult leaders like Jim Jones and Charles Manson and David Koresh. Aztec human sacrifice. Pimps, hustlers, prostitutes, sex trafficking brothels, strippers, Porn stars, not all porn stars, but porn stars are going to tend to gravitate in that direction. So will strippers. That's why strippers have a sort of a reputation of being crazy and psychotic because you sort of have to be to be involved in, in prostitution or stripping or uh, pornography. Violent porn will appeal to stage red. 
snuff films, stage red. King's harems, stage red. Absolute monarchs, feudalism, heads on spikes, Vlad the Impaler, crucifixion, cutting off body parts as legal punishment for violating crimes, cruel and unusual punishment of various sorts. Um, you know, in, in modern democracies, we explicitly ban cruel and unusual punishment in the Constitution and in certain bills of rights and so forth um, just because it was so vicious. Most pre-democratic societies have cruel and unusual punishment, like in Saudi Arabia. By the way, Saudi Arabia is stage red as well. Saudi Arabia, what, what do they have? They have like honor killings, and they have uh, beheadings for criminals in, pu in the public square. You can see how that, that's the sort of cruel and unusual punishment. Uh, vil many villains in movies are stage red. Uh, bullies, colonial exploitation, sweatshops, slavery, the Wild West. Many Wild West movies. Usually the villain in a Wild West movie will be stage red. Uh, the Terminator, Rambo, throwing objects when you're angry, cocaine, heroin, crack, and meth users. These are like the very hard drugs. Suicide bombers, the lesser jihad from Islam, ISIS, domestic violence, MMA and UFC tend to attract and appeal to a lot of stage red people. They... They appeal, it's sort of like a modern day gladiatorial combat. They appeal to that stage red within us. Now, I'm not saying that just because you practice MMA or just because you're interested in UFC that you're automatically full on solid stage red. I'm not saying that. Because like, for example, Joe Rogan loves MMA. He does jujitsu. Uh, he, he commentates on UFC. Uh, and yet he's not red. He's, he's stage green. I would put him at stage green. But still, there is, you can tell there's a, there's a little kernel, at least a little kernel of stage red within him, probably more so in his younger days, which is why that sort of stuff appeals to him. See? Um, and a lot of guys who watch that, they, they, you know, they love that, that bloodlust that you get to see. It appeals to that animal part of you, which is locked away. You know, usually you're working at the office as a computer programmer. You can't, you can't tap into that stage red you know, warrior, blood, thirsty, conquest sort of thrill. But when you're playing a video game or you're engaging in one of these extreme sports or something like UFC, then you you get that that stage red nerve titillated. Uh, boxing also has a lot of stage red in it. Many boxers are stage red. For example, like Mike Tyson. Um, you can see some interviews of him. I mean, he's evolved now. He's probably moving towards orange and green more. He's done 5-MeO DMT, which is good to see. That probably helped evolve him a bit. Um, uh, you know, he's he's much older now. But he, when he was in his early 20s, uh, he was just vicious. He was a vicious animal in the ring. Don King, his, his boxing promoter, also a very stage red sort of guy. Of course, they have plenty of stage orange in them as well. Conor McGregor, stage red and orange. Um, that's why you see Conor McGregor throwing stuff, you know, yelling at stuff, yell, yelling at people, you know, threatening to, to rape their mothers and like all this nasty stuff that he says to promote his fights. You know, only a stage red person would behave that way. Bank robbers, bully and tyrannical bosses. If you have a boss who's just a complete dick to you and actually gets off on, on dominating you, that's a stage red boss. Bribery, bling. You know, that <laughs> pinky diamond ring, uh, gold teeth and chains, which are popular in the hood. The hood itself, uh, a lot of black culture, like rap and so forth, comes from a sort of stage red culture, um, which is why, you know, a lot of conservatives like to say like, oh, well, the biggest problem with racism is black on black crime. You know, black people are just shooting each other in the hood, other black people. So it's not white people who are hurting black people, it's other black people. But that's a function of the systemic racism and the income inequality, which is a legacy from slavery, which of course has created these, these parts in urban areas which have been redlined, and then they don't have enough resources there 
to actually give opportunities to these young black people. So they just join gangs and it becomes the hood culture and they're dealing drugs and they're shooting each other, of course. But that's not because that's black culture. That black culture came from the fact that there was 200 years of slavery and then there was Jim Crow and then there was not any like any sort of reparation, any sort of help to these black communities and their wealth is like 5% of what white wealth is overall because wealth is accumulated over generations. They just don't have the generational wealth. So of course they have a sort of a stage red uh, culture. That, that's, not, that's not a feature of being black. That's a lack of spiral development, which is again, another common failure to make a distinction that many conservatives have when it comes to understanding racism. They tend to think that all oh, blacks have low IQ and that's a genetic problem. It's not a genetic problem. It's a problem of spiral development, uh, which is actually a very optimistic thing because that means that if we equalize the income inequality and we help them out, then they're going to be able to evolve their culture. And then it's not going to be a genetic thing. It's not going to be a function of IQ. Their IQ will actually increase as we create safety net programs for them and as there's more job opportunities for them and so forth, uh, the IQ will equalize, which is what these uh, sort of uh, race IQ people don't really understand because they, they fail to see how culture, how significant culture is and how it shapes our psyches and minds and how it evolves and changes. Drive-by shootings, blood sport. <laughs> it's interesting. I mentioned this example on the forum. Um, there's a story online that I saw about Trump, which said that his favorite movie is blood sport. It's an old eighties Van Damme movie. A great movie, by the way. Um, I think it's probably Van Damme's best movie, but, but this is just so typical of stage red mentality. So what Trump did the movie is like two hours long. Uh, and there's a story to it. it. There's a lot of fighting. You know, Van Damme goes to, to Asia, to China, I think, and he does some underground martial arts competitions. So there's a lot of fighting and blood and so forth. But there's also a story. He has like a love interest. There's relationship stuff going on. Uh, so Trump told his son that he was sick of watching Bloodsport in its entirety because there was like love scenes and other sorts of stuff that he didn't like. He wanted to just fast forward through all that. So he told his son to edit the movie such that it was just pure 60 minutes of just people punching each other in the face, cutting out all the story and everything else. And then to him, that was like the best movie. So it just perfectly exemplifies stage red thinking. Other examples include cockfighting, dogfighting, animal cruelty, uh, sports fights. When you see like in hockey, you know, two guys or a bunch of guys, they start you know, taking off the gloves and punching each other. That's a very stage red sort of activity. Pro wrestling appeals a lot to stage red. They sort of play it up with drama. Uh, uh, the movie Lord of War, actually one of my favorite movies. Oh my God, it's an amazing movie with Nick Cage. If you haven't seen Lord of War, go buy that fucking movie and watch it. It's amazing. Watch it twice. Think of just like... Man, I can't say enough positive things about that movie. It's so well done. It's definitely Nick Cage's best movie. And I think it's probably my favorite movie of all time. Uh, in addition to Ex Machina and Her, I like the movie Her as well. Like really well done movies. But uh, yeah, Lord of War, it, it shows Nick Cage as this uh, weapons dealer. He himself is more stage orange. He's not so much red. But he he goes to these war-torn parts of the world. He's like a stage orange sort of vulture capitalist who goes and sells weapons uh, like AK-47s and M-16s to, uh, to like warlords in Africa and in Eastern Europe. And he does all this drug running and, uh, and uh, sorry, weapons running. Uh, and it just shows all the intricacies of that. And then he deals with these like African dictators who are just totally bloodthirsty. And that's where you get to see the stage red. It's, it's amazing. Um, Alex Jones, very stage red. 
L. Ron Hubbard, the guy behind Scientology, he was sort of a con artist slash swindler. He also had like rape charges against him and uh, the government was after him for all sorts of weird reasons. I don't even know the full story. And then his, uh, his protege, his successor was David Miscavige who runs the Scientology cult. Now, he's also a very stage red guy. There's, there's stories you can read of him like beating, uh, beating people that, that, that don't listen to him. He's very sort of, a, he runs the Scientology organization basically as a cult and as like a totalitarian organization. He's the one in charge. He took over after L. Ron Hubbard died. 9-11 was stage red. The Oklahoma City, uh, City bombing with Timothy McVeigh, stage red. Some insult cult, incel culture, not insult, incel culture is uh, stage red. And there's like this deep, deep, deep misogyny. There's a sort of glorification of rape within that culture. Uh, also, uh, some aspects of the pickup community. I was involved with the pickup community. I'm very intimately familiar with it. I've met many pickup artists, some of the world's greatest. I've interacted with a lot of folks from RSD and, and others. Um, personally, I never, I never indulged in the red aspects of it. I was too conscious for that. I was just basically doing pickup to learn the techniques. The techniques are effective and they're great and I recommend you learn them. But if, you know, if you're a guy and you want to learn to get good with girls, but, uh, but I noticed some very, very toxic stage red aspects to pick up. A lot of pick up pick, a lot of people who get drawn to pick up very heavily, who tend to become coaches, they get drawn to it from a sort of a stage red place. Uh, they're, they're very misogynistic. Uh, they have this toxic masculinity to them. Uh, they glorify rape. Um, they don't take like rape as a serious problem. They treat women just completely as objects. It's about sexual conquest more than even the pleasure of sex or trying to find a girlfriend. It's just about like sexual conquest. Usually these people were beaten or abused in their childhoods. Um, you know, I, I, I've met a few and these are not all pickup artists, so I don't want to smear them all. Some of them are, are good. Some of them, some pickup artists are actually stage green. Um, many of them are orange, but a few of them are red. Like I've, I've seen and I've, I've interacted with some pickup artists who literally had rape charges, like pending rape charges in court. Like they had, they had a court date, like they're going to court next week because they have a rape charge against them. Um, and, and yeah, that, that's, that's very like, that breaks my heart to see that because it's important that we teach men how to be strong men and how to attract women. These are important skills that need to be taught. Otherwise, we get something even worse. We get incel culture, which is even worse than pickup culture. Uh, but there is sort of a glorification of rape within the culture. Like, uh, <laughs> I know a pickup coach who, who has something called a rape van. He drives a van. He bought a van. And if you're into pickup, you know who I'm talking about here, but I won't name his name. But uh, he actually bought a van. This guy bought a van like a used van for $5,000. He drives around to the club, to like a nightclub. He will pull girls from the club into the van. In the van, he has set up like a bed, a, basically a mattress. And he just fucks girls in the van. And, um, and, then, and, then, <laughs> and then what he does is he has, he actually paints a little picture of, he like sort of puts a little picture of, of a woman on the back of the van for every woman he fucks. He has like a hundred of these on the back of the van. So this sort of, and then he makes light of it. Like the whole thing is sort of done as a joke. Um, so that sort of attitude is a very stage red attitude. And uh, on the other hand, I have compassion for him because I've read his life story. This guy comes from a, from a, like a terrible situation where his, his father, when he was, when he was a teenager, his father actually raped and murdered his mother with a shotgun because he found out that she was cheating on him. And so, of course, that that kind of situation will, will definitely send you into a sort of a stage red spiral. Uh, Kanye West. Kanye talks about that dragon energy. <laughs> and then Kanye West, you know, Kanye West... Uh, resonates with Trump. Why does he resonate with Trump? Because they're, they're both, you know, when he says dragon energy, he's talking about stage red values and energy. Rap music, heavy metal music, 
Punk music, these tend to be stage red. Uh, there can be higher forms of it. I'm not saying it has to necessarily be stage red. Uh, people like to debate me on heavy metal, like, oh, Leo, heavy metal actually is green. Uh, most of it is probably red. <laughs> Maybe there's some green. Mexican drug cartels are very red. El Chapo, if you watch some of his, how he ran the Sinaloa drug cartel, he got arrested recently some, some years ago. But this guy was a vicious, vicious stage red mobster. The, grand, the game Grand Theft Auto sort of glorifies stage red. And in fact, many video games are a glorification of stage red. In a sense, many of these violent video games, they let us play out these stage red fantasies in a safe way so that we don't have to do it in real life. You know, you can get a sort of a thrill from curb stomping somebody in, a, in one of these video games or, you know, shooting them in the face with a shotgun and blowing their head off. Yeah, that's stage red. <laughs> Imagine what a stage green video game would look like. A lot fewer of those. Graffiti is stage red. No Country for Old Men, the villain in that movie, is stage red. The Old Testament has a lot of elements of stage red where you have a vengeful God who punishes others. See, the Old Testament was written for a time and a culture in which most of it was stage red. And so spirituality and religion at that time had to appeal to that. You couldn't market a stage green version of, re of religion or Christianity back then because there was no stage green. That's why there's such a sharp contrast between the Old Testament and the New Testament in the Bible. People say they have a different feel. You know, the Old Testament is very vindictive. God is sort of angry and judgmental and, and, uh, and violent. Whereas in the New Testament, you sort of have a more softening of the approach. It's more of the sort of effeminate approach of Jesus, you know, having love and compassion and turning the other cheek. Very different. The Jesus example is more stage green, whereas the Old Testament is more stage red. The Sith from Star Wars is very stage red. Fight Club, stage red. A Clockwork Orange, stage red. Uh, Dan Pina, he's sort of a motivational business leader, coach, teacher. He's got a lot of stage red elements to him, also stage orange. Hunting homeless people for sport, <laughs> that cliche is stage red. The Black Panthers had a bit of stage red in them. The KKK, lynchings, and the sort of torture that they inflicted upon slaves and black people and the sort of terrorism that they that they they, do, they did, and I guess they still continue to do, although less so these days. Machiavelli, and treating women as chattel and literal physical personal property, the way that they do like in Saudi Arabia, or in certain Islamic parts of the world, where women are, you know, basically kept as prisoners, they can't get a bank account, they can't travel without a male companion, they, they can barely go to the store and do shopping with a male companion. Um, they certainly are not, they don't, they don't have the freedom to divorce the husband and a lot of other freedoms that women enjoy in the developed world they don't have. So that's my list of examples for you. If you want even more examples or you want videos of these examples, go to actualize.org slash forum, go to our forum, uh, go to the self-actualization subsection and there you will find a mega thread that we started called Spiral Dynamic Stage Red Examples Mega Thread. In there you will find dozens and dozens of pages and hundreds of examples of all this and you can post more of your examples if you want. So for each one of the spiral stages, we have a dedicated mega thread on the forum there. These are very useful mega threads. Go check them out. We put a lot of work into them. Uh, uh, hundreds of hours went into developing these mega threads to give you concrete examples, videos, links, articles that show you, you know, photographs, images, memes, and so forth that, that show you and teach you how these stages actually look in the real world. So don't miss that opportunity. It's there for you. It's free. Don't have to pay anything. You don't even need to sign up to the forum. You can go look at it. It's public and uh, open to everybody. Here are some common phrases and sayings that exemplify stage red. Might makes right. 
Desperate times require desperate measures. No guts, no glory. You have to break some eggs to make an omelet. An eye for an eye, a tooth for a tooth. It's a dog-eat-dog -dog world. Survival of the fittest. To the victor go the spoils. The world is a jungle. If you're not with us, you're against us. Fight tooth and nail. Take no prisoners. An offer he can't refuse. What's in it for me? Off with his head. And you scratch my back, I scratch yours. Now, let's talk about how to distinguish stage red from orange. Because for many newbies who are just learning about this model, it can be confusing. So here's the difference. Stage orange, for example, will manipulate an exploit on Wall Street to get money. Stage red will not just manipulate to get money, he will get a baseball bat and break your kneecaps if you piss him off. That's the key difference between orange and red. Because a lot of stage green people might look at it and say, well, Leo, what's the difference really? I mean, stage orange is very exploitative too. You know, the, the stage orange capitalists, you know, they're so money hungry and they're all sociopaths. These guys like Jeff Bezos and Bill Gates and um, who else? Elon Musk or whatever, you know, they're just these shameless sociopathic capitalists. All they want is money. They're just greedy. So they're stage red. No, they aren't. They're stage orange. And even a little bit of green as well. Uh, you don't appreciate how more vi how much more vicious stage red is than stage orange. Stage orange is capable of guilt and shame. Stage orange might commit some white-collar crime. Stage orange, sure, they'll be very capitalistic. They will be very competitive. They can be exploitative in the sense that they might, you know, not pay their workers a fair living wage or something like that. And they may not be socialists or communists or Marxists or agree that we need high taxes. Stage orange will not agree with those things. They're generally neoliberal, okay? But they are not Joe Pesci or Tony Soprano, right? They're, um, uh, they generally follow the rules. They're not violent criminals. So you got to make a distinction here between sort of white collar crime and violent crime. Red is more the violent crime. Red will actually enjoy hurting others, enjoy the suffering of others. The CEO, like, you know, of Amazon, Jeff Bezos, he doesn't take pleasure in the suffering of his employees. He's just, you know, he's just a, a full on capitalist. Okay. But he's not stage red. Red cannot control its impulses, and it cannot follow rules. Orange usually can. Orange is rational and strategic. Orange can make plans. Orange can be patient. Orange doesn't fly off the handle into some rage and beat someone with a cane. Orange is capable of remorse and shame. Orange is usually not physically violent, and orange tends to be democratic, at least in principle. Like if you ask Elon Musk or Jeff Bezos or Bill Gates, should we have a democracy? They'll tell you yes. If you ask a stage red person, no, he wants a, a totalitarian regime. He wants to be the boss. Stage orange is scientific, and it tends to be fairly well-educated. And it values science and education. So there's quite a significant difference. What triggers stage red? Signs of weakness, softness, and emotional vulnerability. Stage red doesn't respect that. And it's not open to exploring that within itself, especially as a 
as a man. A stage red man is not going to want to explore his feminine side or be emotionally vulnerable. That's a liability he can't afford. He thinks that's feminine. He thinks that's emasculating. He thinks that's not how a man should be. He's also triggered by disrespect, insult, ridicule, disloyalty, and betrayal. With Donald Trump, you can clearly see how triggered, how easily triggered he is by disrespect and by ridicule. It gnaws at him. You know it gnaws at him. And disloyalty. Everybody around him is disloyal. I mean, there's a few, maybe Mike Pence is loyal, but but many around him are disloyal because they're vultures just like him. And they betray him. You know, they come out with tell-all books and all this sort of stuff. And this, you can tell this hurts him because it hurts his reputation. It it's hurts his fake facade of being the, uh, the successful, rich billionaire, uh, wealthy CEO, you know, competent CEO. Like that whole facade gets crumbled by all these people who come out and then, you know, betray him and tell the true stories of, of, how, of how he behaves and how incompetent he is how narcissistic and selfish he is. Red is triggered by anyone threatening the boss's authority, which you can see in Trump, for example. The surest way to get fired by Trump, as we can tell from the stories, is to try to outshine him. Anybody who works for him has to make sure that they don't outshine him, because as soon as they do, he's going to fire them. Because he's so insecure. And he needs to be the boss. His entire ego is built upon that. That's what his whole life is about. Stage red is also triggered by losing the fight. You can see that Trump's whole identity, for example, is built upon being a winner. So for him, the greatest blow will come from losing an election. That's going to piss him off the most. That's going to make him the most vindictive. And when Trump loses the 2020 election, as I predict he will... It's not guaranteed, but I predict he will lose it. He is so narcissistic that he's going to go down swinging and he's going to try to take the entire ship down with him. You see, a more evolved person than Trump, he would lose the election. He would be sad about it. It would hurt his ego, like a stage orange person. And then he would just move on to other things. Maybe he would go on and start a business or, you know, whatever. Move on with his life. If Trump loses this election, especially if he loses it in a landslide, which is looking like it's likely, given the recent poll numbers, uh, he's going to take it extremely personally. And he is going to devote the rest of his life to exacting vengeance upon stage green uh, and the Democrats and progressives and liberals for, for costing him this election. He's going to take it very personally. In fact, I think one of the reasons he ran in, in the first place in 2016 is because he was at the he was at some dinner where Barack Obama like insulted him in front of everybody and he took it so personally that then he made it like an, an agenda to just to 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 stick it to Obama by by winning and then undoing everything Obama did and that's that's what he's been doing. He takes delight in undoing Obama's work. Because for him it's about conquest and victory and vengeance. He enjoys the vengeance and there are stories of Trump where he enjoys destroying people who have stood in his way. That's his style. See, a stage orange person wouldn't be into that so much. What else triggers red is a lack of action, indecisiveness, and making excuses. Overanalysis and an academic approach to life. See, we know this about Trump as well. He's easily triggered when he's asked to like read uh, a report about some intelligence. It's a 20 page report. He's not going to read that. He wants like a simple PowerPoint presentation with pictures because he doesn't, he doesn't take an academic approach to anything. And you can see in his speeches, all of his policy proposals, they're all just coming purely from the gut there's no research about it. There's no science to it. There's no asking people's opinions or expert count, getting expert counsel from advisors. It's all just purely his own gut and whatever serves him at that moment. It's pure opportunism. And that's why he changes his policies all the time. And he says one thing then one day, then he tweets something, the reverse of it. The next day he changes his mind. 
Uh, it's impossible to negotiate with him because he has no ideology. He has no principles. Uh, he's purely acting out of self-interest. Uh, what else triggers red is a doubt about one's power. And uh, and basically stage green triggers red. Hippie values, and you can see this in Trump as well. Uh, he's very triggered by feminism, uh, social justice warriors, basically democracy, homosexuality. This, this All this sort of stuff triggers stage red because it's seen as soft. Fundamentally, mm, red wants power and it respects only power brute physical power, not the softer aspects of life. It doesn't value relationships and love and compassion and, and generosity and goodness and beauty and truth. No, it's just raw power. Truth is raw power. And you can see that in Trump as well. He has no sense of truth. For him, truth is anything that serves him. That's what truth is, and it changes on a daily basis. Now let's talk about the unhealthy manifestations and excesses of red. Now, of course, we've been talking about it in a sense all along. Um, but there are healthy aspects to red, which we'll get to here in a minute. But first, let's cover the unhealthy ones. Remember, red is not bad. It might seem bad given all the examples I've given you, but it's not bad. But it is pretty brutal, and that's its biggest problem, is that it easily leads to violence, war, dictatorship, abuse, slavery, genocide, mafia, gang warfare. It leads to a sort of a downward cycle of abuse and violence, where I'm violent to you, and then you're violent to me, and I'm even more violent to you, and then you're even more violent to me, and it's just this downward spiral. It tears apart, it tears apart families and communities. Uh, now you might say, well, Leo, if, if it causes all these things, then surely red must be purely bad. But what you have to understand is that, strictly speaking, none of these things that I mentioned are bad. Again, it's bad because you're judging it from your survival agenda, given where you are at the spiral. Bad here is purely relative. Stage red is a step up from purple, for example. So you can't just say it's bad, because if you say stage red is bad, how is a stage purple society going to evolve to stage blue or orange or green if it can't get through stage red? Because it has to go through it. See, Other unhealthy manifestations uh, and excesses, it, it's, it, it causes cruel and unusual punishment and torture a lot of sexual exploitation and rape. Uh, it, it, it treats women very horribly. Uh, oppression of women and minorities, gross human rights abuses. Uh, it's criminal, it's barbaric, it's harsh, it's brutal. Terrorism comes from it. Corruption and theft, especially corruption comes from it, it's very problematic. Many third world countries are crippled by the corruption of stage red. It makes it impossible for that country to have a decent style of living or job opportunities because it's so goddamn corrupt. Uh, other excesses include irrational megalomaniacs, irrational action, lack of analysis and oversimplification, lack of a bigger plan, no systemic thinking. Trump is a perfect example of a zero systems thinking. Uh, sometimes conservatives push back and say that, no, Leo, Trump is a strategic genius. He's playing the Democrats. He's playing the media. He's playing dumb. Actually, he's smart. <laughs> no, he's not smart. He's purely impulsive. He's extremely good at exploiting systems. Do not confuse the exploitation of systems for purely selfish benefit out of uh, irrational megalomania and narcissism. Do not confuse that for systems thinking. Systems thinking go check out my episode called Intro to Systems Thinking. Systems Thinking is about understanding and studying how systems works, the careful mechanics of it, and then nurturing that system for the benefit of all in a selfless way. Stage Red is utterly incapable of this, which you can see in Trump. 
Uh, other excessive aspects are narcissism, sociopathy, and psych psychopathy, as we've talked about. Stage red tends to be like a bull in a china shop. I once posted a, a video on my blog about Trump. It's a 30-second clip that shows uh, a deer accidentally walking into uh, a barber shop, like a, a hair salon. And this, the deer just sort of stumbles in through the glass door. It breaks through the glass horn with its, with its door with its horns, and then it just, it just, it literally, it's a, it's a deer in the china shop sort of situation. It just runs around, you know, everybody is screaming and going crazy because it's got its, you know, sharp horns, and it's like it's hitting its horns against the couches and the tables. It's just knocking everything around, and then thirty seconds later, it just runs out the other window, and it's gone. <laughs> and, and and so I, I said that this is the perfect illustration of, of the Trump presidency. He's just a bull in a china shop. And what he's going to do, ultimately, the legacy of Trump is going to be, you know, when you look back 20, 30 years later uh, in the history book, literally, it's just going to be, the way it's going to look is that Trump came into government as a bull in a china shop. He did a bunch of crazy, irrational things in all sorts of different directions. None of it really worked. None of it was effective. He broke a bunch of institutions and norms and things. And then he exited, he left, and then we moved on. And we had to pick up the pieces and rebuild. That's that's basically he's a he's a chaos agent. That's that's his that's his role. That's gonna be his role. He's not capable of anything else. Because not only is he stage red, but he's deeply incompetent stage red. If he was competent stage red, he would be sort of a Hitler uh Stalin type of figure. Uh, he would be very brutal, but uh, at the same time, you know, he he could get some stuff done. But but he's too incompetent for that. So he he's a unique mix of of, of red and stupid at the same time. Uh, he's also just very lazy. You know, some stage red is like hardworking. You you know, you take a look at someone like Putin in Russia. He has many elements of stage red in him. I think. Uh, but he's well put together. You know, he takes care of his body. He exercises. He um, he's smart. He's intelligent. He's very strategic. He's cold. He's calculating. He's 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 he, you know he's a brilliant sort of geopolitical chess player. Um, and brutal as well, bloodthirsty and ruthless at times as well, um, corrupt as well, but. Uh, but he, he also is getting stuff done for Russia. Um, Trump, unfortunately, is not that. And also Trump, uh, I mean, uh, Russia is a, a, at a much lower level of development than, than America. So Putin for Russia is a relatively okay fit, but Trump for America is, is a no-go fit. doesn't work. Uh, stage red is also a blabber mouth, engages in a lot of bragging, as we see with Trump, uh, only thinks about oneself, can't build quality relationships, uh, and, and ultimately the problem with stage red is that you can't build a stable, decent, peaceful civilization with stage red. It's too unstable. And one of the problems with these dictators and tyrants is that, of course, there's a lot of nepotism at stage red, which, of course, Trump is very guilty of by appointing his sons and daughters to Positions that they have no business being in because they're utterly unqualified and ignorant and competent about how government works. Um, but this nepotism ultimately it breaks down because it becomes a government of the ignorant and the incompetent. And uh, and then how do you transition? Even if Trump became ruler for life, he's pretty old. He would probably die in ten or twenty years, anyways, of natural causes. And then and then what? How do you transition? This is the age-old problem of every authoritarian and dictator and monarch who's ever lived, is that even if you have a, an amazing king who does great things and is very effective and very competent at the cost of being a little bit, you know, too ruthless and bloodthirsty, that can still be tolerated. But what happens when the king dies of old age? You have to replace him, but who do you replace him with? You have to elect somebody. But with a king, there's no elections, so he just picks some crony of his or a child of his, some, some relative, but that relative is not going to be ever as good as the king himself. And so it devolves into utter incompetence. And then eventually they have to be kicked out. There has to be a coup. 
because for a stable society, it needs to be competently run using reason, strategy, systems thinking, and science. One of the problems with stage red is that it's utterly unscientific, which of course we also see with Trump. You know, when you have a serious scientific problem like climate change or COVID-19, uh, Trump's response and a stage red response is to try to like bully your way through this scientific problem, but really it's a problem for scientists to solve. And you got to listen to the scientists and follow their suggestions here with these sorts of issues. You can't just bluster your way out of climate change or a bad economy or, uh, or some sort of pandemic. It doesn't work. So ultimately, red ends up exhausting itself and undermining itself, and that's what leads it to then try to evolve into blue. Because it's it's so chaotic that from red, then we need to we need to we need to build a stable civilization which comes with discipline, which comes with a sense of morality, which is what is developed in stage blue. And lastly, the problem with red is uh, the sort of toxic masculinity and patriarchy that uh that be that that ends up uh, oppressing women. So then you might wonder, what are the healthy and good aspects of red? Here are some of them. First of all, it allows unification of squabbling tribes. So as bad as you might think Saddam Hussein was, as vicious as he was, gassing his people and so forth, as they say, um, removing Saddam Hussein, as we can see now, has proven to be even worse, led to the rise of ISIS and uh, you know terrorists who run around beheading others. What is that? It's, it's an even further, it's basically a, a, a fragmentation. Iraq used to be a unified country under Saddam Hussein's rule. He had to rule with an iron fist and torture people and murder people in order to maintain that cohesion. There was a certain benefit that came from that. Most people don't, don't appreciate the, the, the value of that benefit. But when it falls apart and it all just turns into a bunch of stage purple squabbling tribes who are... Uh, trying to do genocide on other neighboring tribes, you can't even have a state. Without a state, that that country falls apart and it gets eaten up by other countries who are unified, you know, around the region, like Iran and, um, uh, you know, Israel is, is unified in that region and, and other, you know, Turkey is unified there. And so now they're picking apart the carcass of Iraq and Syria. And so... Really, what's going to have to happen in Iraq and in Syria is somebody else like Saddam is going to have to come together and unify them into a cohesive sort of nation. Otherwise, they're going to stay at stage purple. And that's not going to be good. There's going to be a lot of violence and um, they're not going to be able to de develop as a nation. See, a lot of people today, they don't appreciate that nations, countries, this is a relatively new invention. America is only like 250 years old as a country, and other countries are even younger than that. Italy, Germany, we talk about these countries as though they've existed forever, for thousands of years. No, they haven't. There was no Germany. There was no Italy. These were small city-states and regions that were always fighting with each other. Someone had to unify these into, into solid countries. See? And this was done only recently. Most modern countries have only existed for like two, three, four hundred years, if even that. Some countries have only existed for a hundred years. Try to really appreciate how innovative this idea of a, a country is. It's amazing that conservatives today, a lot of conservatives are so nationalist and they talk about like loving our country, loving America, or whatever country you're from. Uh, <laughs> but this, in a sense, this is the idea of a country is such a progressive, modern, liberal development. If you were alive as a conservative 500 years ago, you wouldn't glorify the idea of loving your country. The idea of loving your country would be seen as a radical, utterly leftist, utterly progressive, uh, oppressive, tyrannical thing. 
because a country, after all, has to be unified by some sort of higher power. So the paradox of some of these libertarian philosophies is that they 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 talk about how um, we want America to be free and all this, you know, free from government oppression. But the very notion of a United States is already, in a sense, the thing that the, the that the, the the libertarian would have opposed when it was being built in the first place. I've talked about that in my lengthy video about why libertarianism is not is nonsense. So go check that out if you want to know more. Uh, other healthy aspects of red. So, so anyways, getting back to the healthy aspects. So why is that healthy? Unifying these tribes ultimately is healthy because it allows us then to develop to blue and to orange and to green into higher stages. It's necessary. We can't live as little tribes that are all fighting each other. We need to unify. So that's very valuable. Even though it has a high cost. You have to appreciate that just because something has a high cost doesn't mean that it's bad because the cost of not doing anything might be even higher. You see, it's all relative. A cost is only high compared to something else. So sometimes you're forced to choose the lesser of two evils, which is what stage red is. Other good aspects of red is that it's fast and decisive in its action. It's not a victim. It doesn't sit around and mope and, and cry and talk about how it can't do anything. In a sense, being a victim is even worse than being a little bit hot-blooded and angry. Uh, because at least when you're a little bit angry and hot-blooded, you're not in like this suicidal depression. You're able to accomplish things in the world, which is important. You don't feel helpless. The worst thing is when you're utterly, utterly helpless. You can't even get out of bed in the morning. You're so helpless. And then your only option is basically to kill yourself. So at least red is not that. Uh, also, what's good about red is that it stands up against bullies. It protects against bullies. When you have a big bully, you need another bully to protect you against that bully. So that's a valid function of red. Appreciate that. Like, if Saddam Hussein didn't defend his people, his people would be conquered by neighboring countries like Iran, Israel, uh, Saudi Arabia, I don't know who else is in that region, Turkey. They would, they would pick that country apart. So in a sense, Saddam Hussein was doing a favor for his people by being strong. Even though, of course, it hurts them as well. But you know what hurts even more? When some foreign bully strong man comes in and then devours or exterminates your people completely. That hurts even more. Red can have a sort of a noble warrior spirit at its best. That's also a positive aspect that you might want to even deliberately cultivate. So this list of positive stuff, I'm telling you, because a lot of you guys who fancy yourselves to be very advanced at stage yellow or green or, or, or orange, you might think like, oh, I have nothing to learn from red. Red is just some evil, bad stuff that I, I shouldn't even study. No, there's, there's probably aspects of red, healthy aspects that you haven't fully realized and developed within yourself. So start developing these. These are good. For example, if you like to play victim a lot or you're very indecisive, then you might benefit from, from a bit more uh, development of this stage red aspect of yourself. Develop that noble warrior spirit. Stand up to bullies. Be decisive. Rather than getting lost in analysis paralysis, uh, take action more. Think less. Act from the gut. These can be positive things. Perhaps the most important function of red is simply to survive and to thrive in brutal environments. When you find yourself, for example, in prison, if you do, you might need to rely on red to survive and to thrive in a prison environment. There are certain parts of the world, certain eras you might be born into, maybe in a past life, maybe in a future life, where you're going to have to rely on red to survive. And not just to survive, but thrive. Red is not just survival, it's thrival in brutal environments. Also, what's nice about red is that it tends to be pragmatic. 
rather than superstitious and deeply religious. It doesn't tend to get stuck in religious fanaticism so much, although it can. You know, in, in, in the Middle East, for example, uh, with ISIS, you know, it's, it's a very toxic combination of both stage red, um, viciousness, but also sort of stage blue religious fanaticism. So it's, it's a very toxic mix. Uh, oftentimes, red and blue mixed together, like with Nazi Germany. That was a mixture of red and blue. Um, but also red can be secular. Like in the mob, uh, it's not so much about religious fanaticism. Uh, another healthy aspect is that red offers rapid expansion of civilization and conquest of territory. This can be good. It develops a stronger nation. Of course, it comes at great costs. Uh, red can also be creative, innovative, and nonconformist. So that's good. It's independent. It can take care of itself. It doesn't mooch off of others. It can find innovative solutions to, to survival challenges because it tends to have a lot of ambition and it tends to just be very opportunistic and to find, find new ways of doing things that a conformist society wouldn't be able to do. The statistics on stage red are as follows. These statistics are from the Spile Dynamics book. It says there that roughly 20% of the adult global population is stage red, and that this percentage holds 5% of the world influence. 20% of people with 5% of world influence. The style of government of stage red is clans led by warlords and dictatorships, an exploitative empire, absolute monarchy or tyranny, totalitarian states. It's very power-driven, conquest-driven, very much about enslaving others, rule through intimidation, and stage red tends to surge in times of uncertainty and crisis. For example, if a giant meteor hit the earth and wiped out half the population, stage red would probably come into resurgence because things would be very uncertain. We would be in a panic and in a crisis. We would need rapid action. There's no time to sit around and to deliberate and to be democratic and to care about people's feelings because there's a lot at stake. People are dying. It's an emergency situation. There are loose nuclear weapons. We need order restored quickly. So in this case, most likely what's going to happen is we're going to have uh, a military dictatorship for some period of time, maybe for a few decades, in order to restore order. It's going to be bloody, but it will be better than having, uh, you know, stage purple tribes running around with lo new, loose nuclear weapons trying to exterminate each other. And now let's talk about how to transcend red. What do you do if you're at stage red or you have stage red elements within you that you notice and you want to move beyond them because you find them limiting or problematic? Well, like I mentioned in Pulp Fiction, the character arc of Jules, Samuel Jackson's character, is, is, is actually a very realistic example. So... The way it worked in Pulp Fiction is that at the very beginning, it's Samuel Jackson and John Travolta, and they're basically uh, bullying some, some, some guys who owe their boss money. They shoot a couple of them, um, and then uh, both of them almost get killed because there's some guy hiding in the closet. He jumps out, he fires his giant hand cannon, as they call it, and he, all his shots miss. He, he, he takes like six shots. He surprises... Uh, he surprises Samuel Jackson and John Travolta. Uh, but he's such a terrible shot that he misses all six shots from that revolver and then they end up killing him. And uh, and John, uh, both of these, John Travolta and Samuel Jackson, they're both stage red gangsters. But Samuel L. Jackson, he has sort of a religious, you know, he says that, <laughs> he says that religious uh, passage before he shoots that guy. Uh, you know, um, 
in that sort of flamboyant Tarantino style. But anyways, Samuel Jackson, because he's, he's a bit religious, he interprets this as a, as a new lease on life. He, he interprets it as a miracle. And at the end of the Pulp Fiction movie, uh, Jules and John Travolta, they're sitting there in the cafe and they're just talking. And then Jules tells John Travolta that, you know, what happened to us is a miracle and I'm getting out of the business. And John Travolta's sitting there and he's like, uh, really? No. Well, I mean, what are you going to do? We, we've always been gangsters. How are you going to make a living? And Jules just sitting there. He's like, I don't know, but I, I just, I just feel called to walk the earth. And I feel called to, um, you know, to, to raise myself to a more, you know, moral higher standard. And so basically his arc was that he discovered that stage red is too limited. God gave him a, a, you know, a second chance at life. He was supposed to die. This was a miracle. And that now this pushes him into stage blue. And then the movie ends there. It's actually a, a quite beautiful arc. Uh, I think actually for many people, the way they get out of stage red is they suffer so much. They almost kill themselves or they almost end up in jail or they almost, maybe they even get sent to jail, but then they get released or they almost, uh, you know, die of a drug overdose, something terrible like this. And, but then, you know, it, it, it shocks them awake and it awakens them to the next level where they realize that their life is too chaotic and that they need some discipline and order in their life. And so they commit themselves to a more ordered existence. They just say enough is enough. And one way in which that might happen is that they, they find God or religion. I put God here in quotes because it's not the real God. This is the fake, the fake God, the sort of Judeo-Christian God, the anthropomorphic God. Um, father figure God of the Old Testament uh, of religion, of organized religion. So they find that, maybe they join some church, maybe they they they, they have a born again experience. Uh, and they sort of commit themselves to a more stable life. Maybe they have a uh, they get married, maybe they have a child, and then that, you know, when they have their child, they sort of realize like, what am I doing? All this violence and criminality and all this narcissism. You know, now I have a little child. I have to take care of that. And that might elevate them to stage blue. Basically, to, to rise out of stage red into blue, uh, you need to find some sort of higher power than you. A higher purpose, a higher set of principles or ideals, a higher truth, even if it's not real truth. It's not the you know truth of enlightenment, but some, some sort of truth, whatever it is for you. Maybe it's a sense of life purpose. Maybe it's volunteer work. Maybe you want to you wanna help addicts recover because you used to be an addict. It might be that. Um, maybe you used to work for the mafia and now you're going to go work for the FBI in order to be an informant or to work with them, you know, to dismantle the mafia. You reform yourself that way. Maybe you used to be an ex-convict and then, or a thief. Now you go work for a security company helping to protect against other thieves like you. Maybe you used to be a soldier or whatever, and now you reform yourself, and now you start to advocate for peace. Things like that. Some higher purpose. Uh, you need to open your mind to some kind of morality. This is not going to be some super advanced spiritual morality. This is going to be a morality that's very stage blue, a very rigid uh, set of right and wrong, black and white morality. It's not super advanced. It's got its limits, which I discussed in stage blue, but it's sure as hell better than, than being this sort of reckless uh, bull in a china shop that you've been at stage red. If you want to evolve beyond stage red, recognize the limits of an egocentric life. Start to see the collateral damage and suffering that you're causing to others. Start to see that if everybody lives life like you do, if everybody acts like a bully, the problem is that there's always a bigger bully. Sure, it feels great to dominate others, but what happens when somebody else becomes stronger than you, has more guns than you, has more soldiers than you, has more power than you, and then they dominate you and dominate your family? How are you going to feel then? Not so good. So, after all this fighting and violence, at some point we have to come to a truce and we have to realize, you know what? 
I've hurt you, you've hurt me, this lifestyle can't continue, it's unsustainable, otherwise we're gonna annihilate each other. So let's just calm down, let's set some rules, let's follow some moral principles so that we can uh, create a stable civilization. And when you start to see the power of that, that's how you evolve beyond red. Recognize the limits of violence and force as solving problems. Recognize that really to create a quality society, to have advanced things, to have complexity, we can't use the tool of violence and blunt force to deal with complex systems, which an advanced society needs. Uh, you can't just deal with everybody in a forceful way. You can't deal with your children in a forceful way. You can't maintain a quality marriage by using force and by controlling you know, your wife and so forth and getting angry at her and throwing stuff at her and beating her. It doesn't work. You need a softer approach. Also, start to develop a sense of guilt, shame, and remorse. If you hit your wife and you don't feel guilty about it, you're still stuck at stage red. When you start to feel a little guilty about it, the reason you feel guilty is because you actually use your awareness to realize like, ah, she's crying, she's suffering. My children are seeing this. They're also suffering. You know, my friends are suffering. This, this, this sort of lifestyle that I'm living, it's so self-centered that it's causing suffering. Then that causes me suffering to see others suffering. That causes me guilt and shame and remorse. And now that allows you to start to self-reflect and start to say like, ah, oh, yeah, maybe there's something, maybe I am being a bit of a monster here. Uh, maybe I need to start to discipline myself, start to mellow myself out. And a lot of times I think that that's what happens with stage red people is that stage, stage red, I think is very prevalent amongst teens, you know, angsty teens and people in their early twenties, maybe thirties. Once you start to mature past your thirties into your forties and fifties, the testosterone comes out of your system if you're a young male. Um, you, you just, you calm down, you become more pacified. You've, you've expended a lot of your energy. Uh, you've seen that it's only led to misery and, and chaos and you just, you're tired of it and you just want to like settle down and live a, a more peaceful life. You, you don't want to be on the streets doing drugs anymore. You don't want to be involved in gangs anymore. You're over that. You don't want to be, uh, you know, uh, punching people in the face or getting into, into bar fights anymore. You just want to calm down. You want a, a nice family, a decent job, a community church you can go to, uh, have fun with your friends at the park, whatever, that kind of stuff. And this, this comes, a lot of it comes just with age. I think uh, a lot of people, they grow up in, in abusive families and childhoods and um, they don't get good educations. They don't get, get good parenting. Their parents are, are, aren't there for them. They're drug addicts or they're violent or they molest them or rape them and so forth. And so coming out of this, of course, in your teens, if you have that kind of childhood, in your teens and 20s, you're going to be so lost. You're going to be looking so desperately for ways to survive. Or you're just living in a country which is so underdeveloped and so corrupt that you have no other way to survive. So in your early you know, teens and 20s, you're going to be just finding a way to survive and you're going to be using red for that. And once you achieve, you, you either exhaust that or you achieve a certain level, basic level of success, material success, um, or maybe you move out of that environment, that will allow you to, to move into blue. Develop compassion, of course. See the limitations of authoritarianism. Start to see the importance of rules. Start to develop discipline and work ethic. A lot of times, for example, parents will send their unruly children to a military academy or a boarding school, which is very strict, or a, like a strict religious institution. Why does that work? Of course, it doesn't always work, but uh, it can work because it builds a sense of discipline, work ethic, and morality into an otherwise stage red person. Basically, they're sending a stage red child or teen into a stage blue environment. Uh, that can be problematic, but also it can work. You know, it's better than having your child out on the streets prostituting herself and doing crack. 
sent her to a boarding school, which is very strict. Teach her some, you know, good old fashioned Christian morals. You know, scare scare the shit out of her with with talk of of damnation and and going to hell and and how the devil is gonna you know burn you with fire if you if you're a bad girl. This sort of stuff it, it can work. It's it's crude, but it could work. Uh, maybe study Stoicism, and Stoicism might be sort of a philosophy you can get into. Marcus Aurelius is a good example of a sort of stage blue Stoic. Um, stage blue can be quite healthy when it's about work ethic and discipline. Maybe join the military if you have no sense of direction. If you're hanging around in a bad neighborhood where your only option is drugs and joining a gang, if your option is between that and going into the military, and the military you know, sends you off to some, some other country, you get to explore the world, you get camaraderie and friendship, you're out of some you know, terrible drug, drug-filled neighborhood, you don't have access to drugs when you're in the military, hopefully, and so forth. And so maybe that's how you get your way out. And then of course also you can, you can parlay that military um, uh, stint, you know, five years in the military or whatever, and then you can, maybe they, they pay for your college and then you can use that to educate yourself. So education is actually a very good way to move up from red into blue and orange. Start reading books, consider going to a community college or to a four-year university if you can. Maybe use the military as a leverage to do that. Uh, but of course, you could also just educate yourself. You don't need to go to college. You can do it all yourself if, if you're really ambitious and you're dedicated. Change your environment. That's a huge factor for many people stuck in red. If you're living in a deeply staged red country like Iraq or Syria, uh, one simple fix is to find your, find your way out of that environment. Do whatever you can to move to a high, more highly developed country, whether in Europe or uh, even just within the Middle East. Maybe there's a more developed country in the Middle East. You know, if you're living in Syria, maybe you can move to Turkey. I don't know. I don't know the details of that. I understand it's difficult to move, and a lot of people don't have that option. It's expensive. You need passports and visas and so forth and permits. Um, but you can also look for those opportunities, and if you could find it, change your environment. Or if you're stuck in the hood somewhere where there's gangs and drugs, you got to move out of that. If all your friends are heroin addicts, you got to change your friends. Move to a different city, different state, different country. Hang around with a different crowd. That's huge. Huge, huge, huge. Especially if you're an addict or a criminal. You know, if you're, if you're in the New York mafia, you got to move out of New York. Move to California where the mafia won't affect you. Where they won't find you. Where they won't even be interested in looking for you. Uh, another thing you can do is you can soften and explore your emotions more and explore your feminine side more. Uh, realistically, this will be a difficult thing for you to do because probably you're going to have to go, or you're going to have to go to blue and then even to orange before you start to really start to explore your emotions and your femininity. Um, but if you're, if you're bold, you can try it even at red. It would certainly help. And, uh, try to find some community support groups. To move into blue, oftentimes what helps is support groups such as Alcoholics Anonymous or other kinds of support programs or maybe joining a local community church where you're able to interact with people in a more sort of peaceful, less violent, less brutal way and their stage blue values can rub off on you. They can teach you some discipline. They can teach you how to fit in and be a, a normal functioning member of society. This is basically what you have to do if you're a criminal who's trying to reform himself and not get sucked back into that kind of criminal lifestyle. So there we are. That's stage red for you. In conclusion, remember that stage red is not good or bad. It's all relative. It has its pros and cons. The reason it looks so bad to us is because we're living in a developed part of the world. If you're watching my videos, you're an exceptionally developed person already, just statistically speaking. Otherwise, you wouldn't be interested and you wouldn't stick around. Um, so yeah, for us, for you and for me, Stage Red looks uh, unconscionably evil. 
but it's not evil at all. It's just survival. Remember, everything you call evil is just survival. Somebody else is using what you call evil to feed his children and send them to school. So red has healthy and unhealthy manifestations. Of course, in a highly developed complex society like in America or in uh, Western Europe, a stage red individual is not going to fit in. Most of the stuff that stage red does is going to look very unhealthy because it's so incongruous relative to the level of development of, of this part of the world that we live in. Also remember that red is important to evolve through. People and societies have to evolve through it. You can't just skip it. And also remember that there are probably aspects of you, even if you're, you consider yourself orange or green, there are probably aspects of you which are not fully integrating red. If you're judging red people and red actions, if you are judging and demonizing and calling red societies evil, that shows that you haven't really integrated and understood red, so there is more work for you to do. And the next stage, of course, after red is going to be stage blue. I already have that episode published online. You can go look for it. Watch my entire series if this is the first one that you're seeing. And the last warning I want to give you here before I sign off is this. Remember that red is not a function of race, ethnicity, or religion. This is a common mistake that simple-minded people make who have not made these careful distinctions in spiral dynamics. People will often blame black people or Muslims or Islam or uh, whatever. They will blame them for being inherently less developed, inherently evil, inherently barbaric, inherently uncivilized. This is the sort of myth of, you know, Western culture is the greatest, this conservative myth. This is, this is completely wrong, completely wrong. Yes, generally speaking, Western civilization is more advanced and more developed spirally than other regions and cultures in the world let's say, compared to the Middle East. But this is not a moral superiority. You have to be careful not to turn this into a moral superiority, and you have to be careful not to essentialize this and to link it to something like genetics or DNA or, you know, the Aryan race sort of myth. Um, and you want to be careful, like, with this thing about, you know, black people just, they don't have a high enough IQ or whatever, and that they're, they, they are just red because that's how they are. Black people, all black people are red. No. <laughs> Black culture is not red. Parts of black culture is red because they've been very oppressed for hundreds of years. So that's very natural. But it can all evolve and change. And remember, cultures are growing at different rates. So just because Western culture right now is relatively advanced, that doesn't mean that African culture and Middle Eastern culture and black culture can't evolve uh, relatively quickly in the next 50 or 100 years to to match up or even to rise beyond. See? So, that's very important. Otherwise, you're going to be a racist. <laughs> so, don't, don't be a racist. And also, don't link it to religion the way that Sam Harris does. So, Ham, Sam Harris makes this mistake. Is he, he says that Islam is a uniquely violent religion, more so than Christianity and all others. This is not, this is not, I understand what he's saying, and in a certain sense, it's true, but in a deeper sense, it's deeply misleading. The reason it's misleading is because it tends to characterize all Islam as being stage red without acknowledging that there even is different stages, and it doesn't acknowledge that Islam can rise above red to blue and orange and green and, and, and even turquoise. Not only can it rise, but it already exists at these various stages, of course, in lesser degrees, uh, lesser percentages. Um, but, but, but this idea that Islam is inherently red because there's a couple of passages in the Quran which, you know, talk about violence. This is, this is, 
This is just scientifically and historically incorrect. And that's why people are pissed off at Sam Harris. Muslims are pissed off at Sam Harris because Muslims know that there's different gradations of Islam and there's toxic versions of it and there's more healthy versions of it. And when you say that all of Islam uh, or a large percentage of Islam is toxic stage red and has to stay that way, in a sense, you're creating a self-fulfilling prophecy. You're dooming them to that. And then you're getting a backlash because of course there are many, there are millions of Muslims in the world who practice Islam at a more advanced stage of blue or orange or even green. Uh, and yet Sam Harris would deny really Islam the possibility of rising to green, which, which is problematic because in practice, you're not going to be able to wipe Islam off the face of the earth. In practice, the only thing that's going to happen is that you can evolve Islam out of red to blue, to orange, and to green, and then beyond. And you're not going to do that by demonizing Islam. You're going to do that by actually explaining this stuff. Imagine, for example, if everybody in the, in the Islamic community understood spiral dynamics and understood the different levels of Islam, and then they could clearly make distinctions like, oh, those ISIS guys, okay, yeah, they're stage red, you know, the Wahhabists. But then, you know, in Iran, most of them are stage blue. And then in maybe even other parts of the world or whatever, um, other segments of, of Islam are more like the Sufis and they're more green or more even turquoise. And that's a beautiful thing. And there's, you know, there's value in that. And, and then they could see like, oh yeah, so what we have to do is we have to help people at stage red and stage blue start to interpret Islam in a more stage green, stage turquoise sort of way. How do we create systems that help to evolve them and move them up? Because you're not going to be able to to convince them to drop Islam entirely. So that, that's, a more, that's a more strategic sort of spiral wizardry <laughs> approach to that sort of thing. So you, can you see how making these more nuanced distinctions, how, it's, how it is the solution to all of our geopolitical problems? We're not making nuanced enough distinctions. We're not employing the correct models. We're misdiagnosing the problems. And then people are fighting and blaming each other there's these culture wars that are happening because we're not really understanding what's going on at the psychological level in terms of developmental psychology and consciousness and spirituality. So this, this is what we're talking about here is the operating system which will allow us to develop a more peaceful world. So that's, that's the ultimate value of this spiral dynamic stuff. All right, that's it. I'm done here. Please click that like button for me. I put a lot of research and work into this episode. Um, and uh, you can support me on Patreon with your donations, patreon.com slash actualized. You can come check out my website right here at actualized.org. You will find um, some useful resources. You'll find my blog where I post examples. I post many, many examples of spiral dynamics on my blog, so check those out. Uh, you can also find the forum, where I also I have those mega threads. Go check those out with examples of spiral dynamics, and you can discuss that stuff there. We discuss politics and other cool things there, spirituality and so forth. Uh, check out my life purpose course. Check out my my book list. On my book list, you will find many books about politics, development psychology, and spiral dynamics, which will take you deeper into understanding this material so that you can see that I'm not just making this stuff up. I am pulling a lot of information from books and from high quality resources. That book list has some of the most important books in the world that you can read. It will completely transform your life. It, it's, it's totally worth the price. Go, go check out my book list. So that's it for this one. I just want to remind you of a, a couple of final points about spiral dynamics. Spiral dynamics, even though I talk about it a lot and I use it a lot, I get the sense that people fall into the trap of thinking that I am just obsessed with spiral dynamics and everything is all about spiral dynamics. No. Spiral dynamics is a single lens that I use to look at the world with. It's limited like any other scientific model. Uh, I'm certainly aware of its limitations. Uh, maybe I'll shoot a whole episode in the future talking about its limitations. 
but it's just one lens. And ultimately, you're going to have to drop this lens to really get to the highest levels of understanding that I want to lead you to, that I hope you get to. You will have to ultimately drop spiral dynamics. But still, even though you transcend it, remember it's that old Ken Wilber um, saw of like, transcend and include. You're transcending it, but you're, you're still going to have it in the back pocket to use in certain situations. Especially when we're dealing with social and political situations and cultural situations, spiral dynamics will be very useful for that going forward. Uh, but also, as you do your spiritual work and you have awakenings and so forth, we're going to go beyond, and I'm going to share other models with you. In fact, I have uh, several more episodes that I want to shoot, which I know you guys will love, which are going to be about developmental psychology, but not spiral dynamics. So, see, spiral dynamics is one model within a larger field called developmental psychology, which is, again, just one subfield of psychology as a whole. So the developmental psychology subfield has some amazing academics and authors who have talked about other models, not spiral dynamics, which in a sense mirror what spiral dynamics is talking about, but they talk about it from different perspectives. Like there's moral development. We'll, we'll have an episode on moral development. We'll have uh, various episodes about ego development. So there's like six or ten authors and academics who I want to introduce you to and teach you about, which will have different kinds of developmental models, which will hit upon different facets that spiral dynamics either ignores, or it'll reinforce some aspects of spiral dynamics. It'll just give you more lenses that you can use to get an even more complex and more nuanced understanding with more distinctions about how developmental psychology works. Sometimes people criticize me and they say, oh, Leo, spiral dynamics, it's not very well peer reviewed. It's not very popular within academia. It's not really truly scientific. It's more like pseudoscience. Um, and that's partially true. Uh, after all, it's a very complex model. So it's, it's difficult to quantify it and it's difficult to measure it with formulas, you know, the way that you can with physics or something like that. Uh, or with chemistry or biology, even. Uh, you know, the more the more abstract our models get, the more powerful they get, in a sense, the, the, the more difficult they are to prove in a strict, you know, a s laboratory study, the way that you can with lab rats or something, when you're testing a simplistic physical model. Uh, so that's just the nature of the beast. But, uh, but also, there has been quite a bit of research done by other academics and researchers outside of spiral dynamics, which validate and mirror what spiral dynamics basically is talking about, and I will be introducing you to that research. There's papers and books and, and research that has been done on that. So, um, so the field of developmental psychology itself, this is a legitimate field. This is a serious field with serious academics in serious reputable institutions sitting around doing work on it, and this field is going to grow even more in the future. And there's very important insights from developmental psychology because what we're talking about is personal development. How do you develop the human psyche? What are the different levels? What are the different facets? How does it actually work? What is the progression that typically happens? That's the value of developmental psychology is that we can rely on it to give us sort of a roadmap and a preview of where we're going to go next and where we were before and how we take people who have not developed themselves, and how do we help them to develop themselves to the highest levels. So, if you think about it, this is like a new science, which is based upon the question of how do human beings develop, and what is the most optimum way to develop human beings, both individually and collectively as societies. There's a lot of science that can be done on that. We can spend the next 500 years researching this science, coming up with principles, technologies, ideas, models, and so forth, all of which will be crucial to get us to the next level of human development and evolution. Also remember that no individual person is purely one color. So if you're going to go out there in the world looking for a purely red person, you're probably not going to find it. Although Trump, Trump, Trump does a good job, but uh, but even Trump, he's not purely red. Nobody is purely red. Nobody is purely orange or anything. It's a mixture. 
it's a mixture of this model is a is a mixture of of nuanced layers so someone might have a red core but then with a like a you know an orange shell or aspects of blue mixed in there and so forth so everybody has a certain percentage but also people have a center of gravity so what you're really talking about when we call someone red like when we say trump is red what i really mean is that his center of gravity is red that doesn't mean he doesn't have orange aspects he does it doesn't mean he doesn't have blue aspects he does he probably even has a little bit of green aspects but mostly a massive green shadow all right so there you go um i'm still gonna do one more spiral dynamics episode which will be the stage purple i will not be doing beige because it's just so primitive that i don't think it's it's worth our time uh but after i do the purple one basically i'm gonna have all the stages um the stage turquoise episode what happened with that one is you can't find it on youtube because it actually got taken down um for trademark violation and that's simply because spiral dynamics that that term has actually been trademarked by the spiral dynamics people and so i think what happened was that they they disagreed with some of the ways in which i characterized stage turquoise so they they forced youtube to take it down uh it's a bit of a dick move the, on their part um but uh i still have the audio available on my website so if you go to my website and you sign up to the newsletter you will get a login to the actualize.org site where you can log in and there you can access all the audios and you can find spiral dynamic stage turquoise and i'll also try to re-upload that video to vimeo and post it on my website so it'll be exclusively on my website that will that will come uh probably in the weeks to come so that stage records and then i'll probably have a few more episodes that talk about spiral dynamics not from an individual stage perspective but i will just talk about more of the nuances of how to apply spiral dynamics and how you can use it in different situations like politics relationships business and so forth so stick around for all that and stick around for those developmental psychology episodes those will be very illuminating for you